I would like to um, welcome you all to this Access Open Oslo event. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to um, host here in the European Union delegation to Norway to discuss the very important issue of, this, of carbon capture and storage as a key to unlocking urban carbon neutrality. I am Nicolas de la Granville, and I'm heading this delegation. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizers of today, Sintef and Hafslund Oslo Celsio, in particular, Markus Sebastian Höhle from Celsio, Christine Jordal and Ingeborg Treuerö from Sintef, as well as my um, excellent staff here in the delegation for organizing today's event on this very timely topic. Today, we find ourselves at a historic turning point. Never before has the pressure been stronger to transition to green energy solutions as today. As the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change assessments indicate, we must do everything we can. The European Union is proud to be a global agenda setter and leading this green transition with the European Green Deal. It has delivered historic climate ambitions, both towards 2020, uh, 2030 and becoming completely net zero by 2050. I'm also proud to stand here in Oslo as Norway is one of our closest climate partners. Norway has committed to a target of at least 50 and towards 55% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. The EU and Norway also work closely together on energy, including through the EU-Norway Energy Dialogue. In fact, on the 23rd of June 2022, the EU and Norway issued a joint statement on strengthening energy cooperation even further, deepening our own long-term energy partnership. We stand united, therefore, to ensure Europe's energy security and Europe's green tra transition. Norway is our natural ally in, these both aim, in, these, in both these aims. A reliable supplier contributing to keeping the EU warm and switched on for decades and a crucial partner on clean energy. Today's conference is representative of our cooperation and what we can achieve together. Research, industry and authorities. The Horizon 2020 project Access is one of the largest EU-funded carbon capture and storage studies. The project has re received 150 million kroners, roughly, uh, roughly 15 million euros, from Horizon 2020, the EU's research and innovation program. It, it consists of 16 partners from eight countries. In short, it provides access to cost-efficient, replicable, safe and flexible carbon capture, usage and storage. The European Union has also granted today's access event as a Sustainable Energy Day under the European Sustainable Energy Week. I would also like to mention that when the first pilot testing is finished at Klemetsrud Waste to Energy Facility, the pilot will go on a European tour to test the capture technology on flue gases from different industries such as cement, pulp, and paper. Another great testament of European cooperation. Our common climate, climate ambitions of carbon neutrality will require drastic emission cuts and carbon removals from all our industries. Carbon dioxide removal technologies, including carbon capture, use, and storage, are important tools to this end. In this regard, let me also mention our work towards establishing a Norway-EU Green Alliance as announced on the 23rd of February 2022 by Prime Minister of Norway Jonas Garstöre and Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. As you may know, it consists of several building blocks, CCS being one of them, plus batteries, energy-intensive industries, hydrogen and offshore wind. But I will now leave it to today's experts on CCS to discuss it further and give the floor to Sintef's chief market developer, Marty, Marie Biesveen, 
I wish you all a great conference and tack for me. Thank you. Please, Marie. Thank you. So thank you, um, Mr. Ambassador. This was a very nice introduction um, to a day that I have been looking so much forward to. Um, I will not spend very much more time before I introduce the first uh, speaker following the ambassador. Uh, and uh, I would um, like to uh, actually uh, go directly to um, uh, Mr. Per Olof Granström, uh, who is the EU director in the Zero Emissions Platform, and he will be joining us online. Um, I'm wondering if... Uh, I guess. Hello, Per Olof. Can you hear me? Oh, good morning. I can uh, hear you loud and clear. Oh, good Thank morning. You uh, so, Per Olof, you will be talking about making CCS a success story, uh, state of play, and the road ahead. And I know that we are really lucky to have you with us. Uh, you are at the core of. Uh, uh, of knowing where Europe is going and uh, what are the challenges, and especially seen from the industry side. So I will not spend more time and uh, um, welcome you, Per Olof, to, uh, to tell, us, uh, tell us about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marie, and uh, good morning to all. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, so, I first of all would like to congratulate you on the AXIS project, uh, really, really interesting. I'm really sorry I cannot be there uh, in Oslo today uh, in person, and I also have to uh, go to another presentation later on, so I will not be able to join uh, the, uh, uh, the discussions. Uh, there are loads of things we can congratulate Norway and Oslo about regarding CCUS, but just to highlight one thing, Oslo, congratulations on uh, organizing or holding the European Commission CCUS Forum later on in October this year. So, as Marie said, I will highlight a little bit of the overview and the state of play, and hopefully I will give some uh, food for thought for the uh, discussions that will that will come later. So first, a let's see if I can move the slides. Yes, I can. First, a couple of of uh, words regarding the European uh, zero emissions platform. Uh, so it is the advisor to the European Union regarding CCS and CCU. Uh, it is, of course, the ETIP, or European Technology and Innovation Platform, under the set plan. We have a very, very broad uh, set of, of members, everything from oil and gas industries, utilities, equipment suppliers, researchers, and even unions and environmental NGOs. And this makes this platform a very, very good basis for discussions. We are coordinating with I would almost say most of uh, national uh, European and international uh, projects and other uh, platforms uh, uh, looking at CCS and CCU. And we consider ourselves as the go-to uh, organization to liaise with the European institutions. And we also have very good cooperation with member states. Just to highlight that we have, uh, for the last year, we've had 22 government participating in our government group work, work. So really, 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 really good. Uh, I would also just to highlight that the zero emissions platform will uh, cooperate and coordinate all its work uh, with uh, the uh, set plan implementation plan working group on CCS and, and CCU. And this implementation plan working group is 11 countries uh, in Europe uh, and it's shared by Norway, the Netherlands and uh, the zero emissions platform and it's all focused on trying to really accelerate the transition by co coordinating uh, 
uh, stakeholders on uh, CC US RNI in Europe. So really, really strong uh, development and really good that we will coordinate this work. And I would also like to take this opportunity to invite you all to the 14th of December when we have the next in-person all day meeting with these two very important platforms in, in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, so just a couple of words. Uh, we can see a really, really strong development of European CCUS projects and policies, as, as you uh, all may know. And uh, uh, there are uh, so many cross-border agreements and cooperations uh, on CO2 infrastructure. So there is really, really a positive momentum. But just a short couple of words. First of all, it started out with the CCS on coal power demonstrations in Europe, of course, and I was myself in involved a little bit in the Jens Walde Vattenfall uh, demonstration in, in Germany. Uh, this took a, a brutal ending, as you, you know, with all these demonstrations. And I would, a personal low point for me was uh, when we could see 500 to 700 euros per ton in, in subsidies for renewables in a couple of countries in Southern Europe in 2015, at the same time as the uh, EU ETS price was lower than 10 euros per ton. But then the turning point, of course, the Paris Agreement, uh, very, very important, and uh, uh, also looking at the European Commission's vision for a clean planet by 2050, where both CCS and CDR, carbon dioxide removals, were very, very clearly highlighted as, as absolutely needed in order to reach uh, climate neutrality in 2015. The real uh, formal starting point was, of course, the European Green Deal and the European Climate Law that we saw in 2019. Now we have a very, very strong development, I would like to say, and I will come back to a couple of these things. Uh, from the European Commission, uh, I would say that the CCUS Forum is the, really the main and clear vehicle for developing uh, CCS and CCU in, in Europe. Of course, this has to be put in context. We have a, a very, very difficult situation. And the uh, security of energy supply has not uh, been uh, or developed in a positive way since 2020. And now we have the energy and, and Ukraine crisis. And of course, uh, we have to work even harder regarding focusing on CCS and CCU here when there is an obvious risk of short-termism in the developments and the focus on what is really, uh, really, uh, really here and now. The whole Europe on CCUS, uh, the focus is, of course, on cross-border. That is the European approach, but that is uh, how we need to uh, develop this going for, forward. A couple more words regarding the positive momentum, just to highlight the IEA uh, net zero by 2050, where they have highlighted in uh, one of the scenarios, 7.6 gigatons per year captured in 2050. And uh, from that 2.4 gigatons, uh, that is from bioenergy and CCS and, and with that, so a very, very strong uh, target to look at. And also to highlight the University College uh, London Energy Institute study two years ago, which clearly highlights the, the extreme need of CCS and CDR. There are 1.5 scenario points at one gigaton per year in 2050. And uh, there is a strong, strong need for a European CCS uh, industry. Just to highlight that this study couldn't find a real uh, a real consensus regarding CCU. It took into account, I would say, all both global and European studies at the time. Very strong basis for developing going forward. So looking at the situation right now, we have more than 60 so-called market-ready uh, CCS and CCU projects in Europe. 
uh, that will be uh, operational before 2030. And we really need to act now. As you can see from the zero emissions platform map to the right, and as you already know, the uh, storage is not evenly distributed in Europe. So we really need to focus on the CO2 transport infrastructure. And to make it open, uh, to make it cross-border so that everyone can join, everyone can link to this. And of course, we need to take into account all modalities. And it's very clear also from the European Commission that the 2020s are really, really crucial, where we really need to see these technologies developed, tested at scale, in, uh, and uh, uh, in order to make it possible to go full. Uh, please don't read this slide, uh, but just to highlight very, very quickly that there are many policy initiatives going on. And just to highlight that, of course, as we see, said, the CO2 infrastructure, both looking at the transport part and the storage part is, is really, really crucial here. The Commission has a couple of, of studies uh, uh, going on. This is linked to the CCUS forum, where zero emissions platform is involved in in uh, and the co-chairing work both on the CO2 uh, storage and transport infrastructure and uh, and uh, industrial partnership development. So really, really crucial. Uh, also very important in the CCUS forum is of course the basis for it all, a real EU strategy on CCS and CCU. Uh, I would also like to highlight, of course, the revision of the guidance documents. They're really, really important documents that will help uh, both governments and projects to uh, do the right thing regarding uh, and, uh, CO2 storage. The revision will be uh, very, very important going forward. And we will hear more from Fabienne later on regarding carbon dioxide removal with the uh, regulatory framework being presented in December. Very crucial development uh, linking also to uh, to the monitoring, monitoring and reporting uh, regulation, the voluntary markets and and also the compliance with Article 6 under, under the Paris Agreement. I would also very strongly highlight the national energy and climate plans that will be re revised next year. A crucial importance to include CCS and CCU and the CO2 transport infrastructure uh, in their plans going, going forward. Uh, so financing and funding, of course, really, really crucial uh, to uh, combined and to coordinate member state funding with the EU funding. And just to highlight a couple of things going from research to demonstration and to commercialization from left to right. The Horizon Europe program, we are still waiting for the work program 23-24, where which will include both carbon dioxide removal, CCU and uh, transport and storage demonstration. Really, really really important. There are several partnerships where CCS and CCU are included. And I would here also like to highlight the revamping of the set plan, where we will see this in, a, in possibly a month, uh, how this will be set up going forward. Regarding demonstrations, of course, really, really positive uh, on the second call on uh, the results on CCS and CCU on the Innovation Fund. And we have a third Call, uh, large scale call coming up in November, uh, both with an extra focus on Repower EU, but also including CCS and CCU. To the right, just to highlight the Connecting Europe facility, the 10E regulation that now uh, will also include storage in the, in the CO2 infrastructure cross border projects, really, really crucial going forward. And as I said, to coordinate this also with the member state funding. So one of the most important bases going forward and where the Commission is working on a, on a vision is, of course, to have a real EU strategy on CCS and CCU. 
that connects to the energy infrastructure uh, strategy and also uh, the uh, hydrogen uh, strategy. A really clear target and enabling policies on, on CCUS. Uh, the cross-border, of course, and here we can see that apart from what we call today the CCS directive, that is a storage directive, we also need a new regulatory framework for CO2 transport. We only have specific focus on projects in the in the EU legislation and so far. Storage appraisal, we will need a lot more storage uh, going forward. And just to highlight here, uh, the CO2 or the CCUS forum, the work that is going on where ZEP is co-chairing two of these working groups. And as I said, in Oslo on the 27th of October, uh, uh, there will be the next uh, uh, forum plenary. So to conclude, and hopefully uh, there will be a lot of discussions about this going forward. We really need to make it economically feasible to invest in all parts in the CCUS value chain. Really, really crucial. Uh, looking at the funding programs, we have to coordinate uh, these really, really well between the member states and the EU. We need the continued strong support for, for the RNI in Horizon Europe, and the set plan here will be very, very important. We still need more, maybe not more in Norway, but in the rest of Europe, we need real political recognition uh, on CCS and CCU and the infrastructure. And finally, just to reiterate that one, one more time, the work uh, on uh, EU strategy for CCS and CCU will be crucial and the Commission will, has promised to come back at the end of next year with a communication uh, that will open up for 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 this at, uh, so we are really looking forward to this so with that i would like to, to thank you very much for your attention and i wish you a great a great uh, day and a great discussion going forward thank you very much over to you Mike. uh <clears throat> thank you so much uh, per Olof. um this was uh, comprehensive uh, and complex uh, and important. Um, and we actually have time for one, maybe two questions. Um, and I will be assisted by my colleague Ingeborg because there might have been questions online. No, no questions online. <laughs> so um, this is uh, a very good opportunity to, um, for you to, to ask questions to Perulov uh, on these issues. Um, Maybe some questions on the roles of cities, or yes, René from uh, Zurich. <laughs> not, uh, um, not EU member, but uh, of course we need cooperation, huge cooperation with EU. Um, Switzerland um, needs this uh, logistic infrastructure. Um, Olaf, when do we have the CO2 pipeline in Europe that we can use? Oh. Uh, thank you very much. You you went straight for <laughs> for my favorite item uh, and uh, and the possibility to build this infrastructure. I think we can see we can see a starting point now. We see the the very good uh, uh, MOUs between several uh, European countries. We can see the pipeline uh, um, the pipeline uh, link between Norway and Belgium that has been. Uh, highlighted, and also the same between Norway and Germany. We can also see the starting point in the Benelux countries and in Germany regarding uh, uh, CO2 infrastructure transport plans. Uh, of course, this will start off uh, like yeah, uh, point to point connections, and we really need a, a, a really good. Uh, business model and a new regulatory framework in order for all countries to, to, to help out here. Hopefully, this will be very, very fast and, and, and kickstart really fast, uh, because this will be the basis for, and to make it uh, possible for investors and companies to invest in the capture part. 
I can't give you a timing, but we really need to kickstart it now. Okay, I actually thank you for, for that. I th think we will need to move on. So thanks again, uh, Pirulov, for your very nice uh, overview. And uh, by that, I will be um, turning over to uh, Mr. Fabian Ramos, uh, who is the policy officer in the European Commission. Uh, and he will also be speaking uh, online. Um, he will be speaking about the role of sustainable carbon cycles for reaching the European climate goals. So let's uh, see um, uh, if we have um, Mr. Ramos online. Yes, uh, hello everybody. I'm oh. online. I'm, uh, I'm sharing my screen now, then you can see uh, my slides. Now we can very see you. Yeah. And, and now you should be able to see my slides. Yes, now we have your slides uh, and maybe... Uh, but not... Yeah, I, I have them in... A, yeah, I'm going to put them in the presentation yeah. mode. Perfect. Ah. Oh, good. Yeah, okay. There you are. Okay. So, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start from the first slide here. Uh, Thank you very much for for inviting me today to to present uh, what we are doing at the European Commission uh, on files related to CCU CCS. Uh, I'm very happy because uh, I know that the Access Project uh, um, that many things that I, I'm going to talk about uh, today uh, are also very present in um, in the concepts of of the Access Project, and uh, I'm I'm very happy. Uh, that uh, we have today uh, such a project. So I'm going to start with um, talking a bit about uh, this uh, communication that we have presented at the end of next year on a strategy for sustainable carbon uh, cycle in Europe. Um, when uh, So I think uh, uh, Per Olof mentioned the work that we did in, in 2018 uh, for a clean planet for all, where we look in the detail of all the economic sector to see how we can reach this 2050 climate neutrality objectives. And at that time, um, uh, I was actually working very closely on the modeling of this communication, underlying this communication. And uh, we looked at many scenarios and, uh, and we tried to see, is it possible to do without CCS, without CCU? And, uh, and the conclusion was uh, no. By 2050, if we want to be climate neutral, uh, we will need CCU, CCS in uh, in any scenario. Of course, because there will be residual emissions, in particular non-CO2 emissions in agriculture, but also for air transport, probably some, and for um, some industries. We we can rely on a stronger LUCF sink, but it will not be enough. And in any scenario, CCS and CCU are present. So, of course, depending on the technological assumptions, but depending on the lifestyles, etc., you can have different level of uh, CO2 that you need to capture for reuse or storage, but in, in any scenario you need it. So that's why after that, um, so we, of course, uh, we focused on, on, on the climate law to set into law these 2050 objectives and on the fit for 55 legal proposals to um, to get ready to have uh, all the possibility to go towards this 2050 and starting by 2030, so setting new objectives in 2030 to be able to reach climate neutrality in 2050, to be on the trajectory towards climate neutrality. But very quickly, it was obvious that um, uh, we needed to do something else and something more dedicated to uh, carbon uh, dioxide removals to uh, reuse recycling carbon in our industry to replace fossil fuels. And that's why uh, end of uh, 2021, we came with um, this uh, communication on sustainable carbon cycles. So uh, this communication is very clear. To be climate neutral, we need, of course, to continue to reduce as much as possible uh, the emissions. And this is uh, the first objective of the Fit for 55. But we need to capture, to recycle carbon, to store carbon in the ground. In this communication, you will not, it's not a communication that is focusing only on CCU, CCS. This is also a communication that is looking at uh, what we can do with our land, with our forest, 
and that uh, uh, a full chapter on the carbon farming and trying to to present a way we could go to to support our farmers, our foresters to absorb more carbon from the atmosphere, either for storage or also for reuse in our economy and to replace fossil carbon with biogenic carbon where it's possible and always in a in a sustainable way, of course. But then the next chapter of the communication is on the industrial capture, use, transport and storage of carbon. So we, we looked at how much carbon we need in our society today, how much carbon we could need in our society uh, tomorrow or in 2013, 2050, um, depending on different scenarios, and, uh, and try to see if it's possible to source carbon differently, to recycle more carbon, and, and to use uh, more sustainable biomass to, to produce uh, plastics of the future or other type of material, also in construction material, very important. And then we also look at what should be, once you capture the CO2, what should be, what should do we do on that? Should we primarily do CCU or CCS? And, and, and we looked at a different scenario, analyzed that. So when I'm talking about uh, industrial capture and use of carbon, I'm, I'm talking about, of course, I'm thinking about solutions such as uh, uh, bioenergy and CCS. I, I'm thinking about the direct air capture. Um, and um, well, I already uh, mentioned it briefly. Um, we 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 need carbon for the construction, for buildings, for future buildings, for plastics, and uh, and so on. Um, in uh, this uh, slide, I pre I I put a, a bit more focus on how much in our different scenario, how much CO two we need to capture, and how much CO two and where we are going to use the, the CO2 that has been captured, how we are going to do it. And there are two scenarios. One scenario is here called the induced scenario for industrial. And this is a scenario where we assume that there is a very good develop, technological development, but also um, infrastructure development. I mean, for instance, and uh, this is an element very important, it's um, the transport of CO2, as per, uh, per all of we're saying. And so developing the infrastructure that allow an open access of CO2 across the different country of uh, of the European Union. And I would like to say also not only European Union, but uh, Europe at large. Um, and then the ecosystem scenario is a scenario where we see uh, yeah, less development of all these uh, technological aspects, but more driven by a change in uh, in the habit of uh, of European citizen in diets in the transport mode and 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 this kind of element, and you see that in both cases we need hundreds millions of ton of CO2 to be captured, captured directly from the atmosphere. This is a blue part here, captured uh, from uh, biomass or so after photosynthesis, or captured from um, also from fossil fuel because uh, I think we should not. Um, we should keep in mind that uh, for now we uh, the, the urgency is in developing the infrastructure in developing the storage site for for carbon so we should not look only at uh, atmospheric carbon or biomass carbon but we should also in the midterm uh, to continue to look at uh, fossil carbon to be captured and stored in the long term i think my personal view is that we need to yeah to phase out the use of uh, fossil carbon towards 2050, but to reach this uh, long-term objective, we need uh, to develop uh, solutions to capture CO2 from uh, from industries and to store it uh, in the ground or to reuse it. Um, and uh, about, uh, so yes, about uh, 300 million tons of CO2 in the ecosystem scenario to be captured and, uh, and more than 500 million tons in, um, in the induced scenario. And when you, you look at what we do with that, um, a big part of it will uh, be needed to produce the fuels of the future, the synthetic fuels, the advanced biofuels, um, also for biomaterials, and part of it will, will have to be stored to, to generate the negative emissions that we need to offset the remaining emissions. So what do we do at the 
level of the European Commission, you know very well that we have this uh, innovation fund. Um, and here, this is a slide of the, the first uh, call for um, the first of the kind of projects. Um, and, and we see, uh, the, the, yeah, a very a lot of very interesting CCUS project. And uh, now I know that the second call is um, is in an advanced phase also, and, and we will have also a third uh, large call, uh, uh, call for large project uh, soon. Uh, an element that uh, was uh, mentioned in the previous presentation, and I already hint to it, is um, to, to open the need for an open access cross-border CO2 infrastructure that is really crucial. In, if we want to develop CO2, uh, uh, CCS, sorry, and deploy solutions at the scale that we need for uh, 2050 climate neutrality, we need uh, to do, develop that, and it will be, of course, a key element of um, the strategy uh, that uh, we, the Commission is going to prepare for end of next year on, on CCUS, as uh, mentioned by, by Perolov. Um, we, we intend to, so we will look at different aspects, and, and this one will be, uh, uh, of course, an essential element of the strategy. Um, the strategy should be seen also a little bit in the, the continuation of the, the strategy of last year on uh, sustainable carbon cycles. Um, where we, we look at the full picture, and now we, we need to, to focus uh, more on technological aspects uh, and the storage aspects of this and reuse. Um, but this year, before that, this year, we will come with a, a legislative proposal for the certification of carbon removal. So what is our intention now? Uh, we know that carbon removal are not enough recognized uh, in the policy framework. If you look at the ETS, um, as I often say, we recognize um, that when you burn biomass, carbon has been captured uh, through photosynthesis before, so you don't have to surrender allowances. Uh, when you store carbon in CCS uh, facilities, you also don't need to surrender allowances under the ETS because the carbon is not emitted. But when you combine biomass and, and CCS, you, the ETS currently today is not recognizing that is a, a negative emission. Um, and in the future, we will need to do that. If we want to be climate neutral by 2050, we need to, to offset the residual emissions with um, uh, 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 negative emissions, carbon removals. Uh, and so it has to, we will have to, to integrate all that post-2030. Not today, uh, not in the context of the 55, fifth for 55, it has been clearly said many times, but in the future, we will need to do that. And to do that, we have to get ready for, for, for that. We have to put in place a framework to be sure that everything is accounted robustly, that uh, there is a, a good monitoring of uh, the carbon stored once it's stored. Um, we have also to look at sustainability aspects. And when you talk about bags, you all, immediately some people will say yes, but uh, we have to be very careful that the biomass is produ produced sustainably. Uh, we have to, when it's about direct air capture and CCS, this is a quantity of energy that is required for the capture of CO2 that is very important. And we have to, to be sure that um, you don't emit more to produce the energy than when you capture with the, the direct air capture plant, etc., etc. So that's why we thought it was important right now to establish a framework to to look at, at these things and to to have a certification framework to, to be sure that only sustainable and high quality carbon removals will be integrated later on in our, in our regulation. But today, um, the, the focus is clearly on, on a voluntary action. So we want to test all this carbon removal solution, all this certification framework um, through voluntary actions and, and not uh, integrated immediately in our regulatory framework, because uh, yes, we need, uh, as always, and we, we need first um, to be sure that everything is working correctly before a uh, full integration uh, in our climate policies. So for that, at the end of the year, we present a general framework, um, and then we will need to develop methodologies for this framework, because the framework will be, will cover all types removals and then after that we need to develop specific methodology for 
CCS storage, for uh, I don't know afforestation, for instance, for building um, construction products, and and so on. And to do this, uh, we need the support of experts, and that's why we launched a, a call for experts last um, before the summer. And this call, I think, uh, cl was closed on the 15th of September. We received a lot of applications. We have more than uh, uh, 300 applications to, to look at, to assess. And, um, and then, uh, as soon as possible, we'll constitute this, uh, this uh, group of experts. We hope we will be able to, to run uh, uh, the first meeting of this uh, expert group before the end of the year. It might be difficult and it will be more early next year. Um, about 70 experts, all type of experts in uh, all different uh, fields of this carbon removal uh, to, to support us to, to prepare together the methodologies we need for the, a good certification of, uh, of carbon removals. I think on the last slide, yes, I have different uh, links uh, on the topics that uh, I presented today. So I'm very happy to to take any questions. I will be able also to join the panel discussion that we will have uh, later on. Thank you. Very useful, very important. Uh, again, Fabian, um, I think we could have time for one uh, one question before we have to to hurry hurry on uh, to the next one. Yes, one question here in the here in the room. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. I saw a slide that says that that said that in 2050, 300 million tons of carbon dioxide need to be captured. And there was a large part of that that uh, I could not read the statistics well, but it's about 120 million tons that need to be captured in direct air capture. I know mm. about a lot of projects that do carbon capture at production processes, that transport, but I, so far I only know of very few direct air capture projects. And if, you, if we need 30% of, um, of, of carbon capture through these direct air capture projects, uh, how are we going to get there, and why do we hear so little about um, that specific part of um, of CC uh, of carbon capture? Yes, this is an excellent question. Um, and so, first of all, these are scenarios developed in uh, 2018 uh, in the context of uh, of this uh, clean planet for all. So, of the long-term strategy uh, that the European Commission proposed uh, for for 2050 and for climate neutrality. Um, so we looked at the different scenario and uh, this is true that in, in, in all scenarios, there were a substantial part of the CO2 captures that was coming from direct air capture. And today, uh, when you look at the number, uh, I think we are, I don't know how many, how much CO2 we capture from the direct air capture plants, but uh, uh, probably less than uh, uh, 100 uh, kilotons of CO2. Uh, maybe a little bit more. I don't have in mind all the numbers. I know that the plans are to do half a ton in uh, next year or, or, or in 2024. And in 2030, we, will, we might reach the first uh, megatons. But this is very far from the 120 million tons that uh, we need to, to, to capture by 2030. Um, and we also have to ensure that all this carbon is captured the, because this needs a lot of energy and we have to be sure that uh, the energy is produced from renewable sources of energy. It doesn't make sense to, to, co to burn coal or gas uh, to then after capture uh, the CO2 from the atmosphere. So all that, this is uh, some things that we need to develop. We, see, we need to see how it will go. Maybe uh, when we are in 2050, the numbers will be slightly different. There will be more about other sources of carbon. But in 2050, uh, we think this is, if we put the right effort on that, if we have the right development, if the right support, we think that uh, our scenarios are saying that uh, it's reachable, economic and technological scenarios. Uh, just one last point. It doesn't mean that in the meantime, we should just wait that this direct air capture is ready. No. Today, we have to exploit all the sources of carbon that we have and where we have the, the purest uh, sources of carbon, where it's the easiest to capture, the most cost efficient to develop the CCS, to develop the CCU technology. And when direct air capture will be ready, then it will have an important role to play. 
Thank you. Um, we should have had much more time to discuss that, but um, I would like to, to, to make a final thank you to you, uh, uh, Fabian, and uh, I'm uh, happy to, uh, we are happy to come back to you in the panel discussion. So thank you. Um, next, uh, we are now going from a European perspective to a slightly uh, more Norwegian one, still, of course, being very European. <laughs> and I'm happy to introduce Mr. Alexander Eng, uh, Deputy Director General uh, at the CCS section at the Norwegian Ministry of Petroleum and Energy. And you will be uh, talking about the first long ship that has just left shore. Uh, and when can new projects set sail? So I'm looking forward to that. I can, uh, thank you. Um, Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I can assure you that I, I probably won't answer that question uh, in my talk, uh, but, but I think I have a, a few interesting things to, perspectives to, to provide anyway. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm delighted uh, that the Commission has asked uh, us to host the CCUS Forum in Oslo on the 27th of October. Um, this was um, this is new to me uh, two or three days ago, uh, and it was very welcome news. So, looking forward to that. The key challenge for uh, CCS is to bring down costs. When we prepared the decision basis for the Longship project, we asked DNV, the consultants, to look at the potential for future cost reductions. What they found was that for every doubling of global capacity, unit costs will fall by 10%. The three sources, or three important sources of cost reductions are scaling up, improving technology, and developing efficient business models and regulatory systems. Scaling up is the easiest way to bring down the cost per ton. There are a lot of fixed costs that don't increase with volume. An example is offshore pipelines, where the cost is mainly a function of the day rate of the offshore vessel, not the diameter of the pipeline. Research is important, but so is sharing from one project to the next. A key objective of the Longship, Longship project is to develop and share knowledge. The Celsio and uh, Norsham pr uh, capture projects provide a huge potential for replication. They're doing a great job in sharing knowledge from their projects. There are more than 500 waste incineration facilities in Europe um, that can learn from Celsio. Heidelberg Materials uh, are, build, are already building uh, on the Longship project to develop projects in Sweden, Canada, and the UK. By 2030, Heidelberg Materials plan to capture 10 million tons per annum. If we are to develop, if we're able to develop a market for CO2 with more storages in the North Sea, that can, they can use each other as backups and we can reduce redundancy. We would need fewer wells, and that would bring down costs. A key task for governments is to provide stable and predictable frameworks that result in long-term investments at a reasonable cost of capital. To unlock these cost reductions, we need collaboration and trust. When we developed the structure for Longship, it was important for us to set up a system that combined the strong forces of collaboration and market forces. In August, Yara in the Netherlands and Northern Lights announced a commercial agreement to fill phase one of um, Northern Lights. And I believe this is a result of the support model that we developed for Longship. We're also experiencing substantial interest in acreage for commercial storage projects. We have awarded two licenses this year and are currently assessing applications for a third license. The Longship project is a one-off for the Norwegian government. We developed a very tailored approach for Longship, and the government is heavily involved and takes a lot of cost and risk. And this was necessary for the first project, and it worked very well. But going forward, we need to move towards more market-based solutions. CCS needs to be able to compete with other technologies. The ability to compete with other technologies is the reason the government is so heavily involved at this stage. The purpose is to support the development of CCS so it become, becomes one of the most cost-efficient tools in the toolbox. 
if we achieve that, CCS will have a material impact. The work that's being done by uh, ACCESS is very important to meet the policy goals for CCS. Collaboration between industry and governments across Europe is key to success. I'm looking forward to our discussions uh, throughout the day. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to seeing you at the CCUS Forum on October 27th here in Oslo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess there are questions to Mr. <laughs> um, are there any obvious questions? Um, I'm really tempted to ask a question about the potential speeding up of uh, preparing new licenses uh, for CO2 storage and how you see, is, do you see the oil and gas industry and the CO2 storage industry as competitors or how do you, uh, is, um, how, would, how are you planning to, to make sure that the, there will be sufficient storage capacity and that we kind of use the opportunity? Uh, hmm. in Norway. Well, it, it, uh, so far it is oil and gas companies that are uh, coming to us to, to ask for, for acreage. Uh, so it's, it's really the oil and gas companies that are driving this, the storage uh, business forward. Uh, and uh, it makes sense. They have the, the, the subsea, uh, subsurface competence, the reservoir engineering models and, and so on. Uh, and uh, speeding up... Um, we have an open door policy. Um, I see that other countries have sort of announced rounds where they, they award licenses in, in, in fixed rounds uh, once or twice a year. Um, but we, at this point, we feel the right approach is to have an open door policy. Companies can come to us uh, at any point in time and point to uh, acreage and say, we want to nominate this. Uh, and we have a, a, a commercial plan and, and a development plan for this specific acreage. And then uh, we'll look at that plan and then we'll, we'll uh, open up for competition from, from others. And then we have a six to nine weeks uh, application uh, deadline f for people to come and say, we have a, we have a firm plan, there's a, there's a commercial model behind it, uh, and then we'll, we'll make the award, and it takes uh, around six to nine months to, to do this, and uh, we, um, w we don't see ourselves as, as the bottleneck here at all, uh, and, and we're seeing a lot of interest from from uh, most of the major oil and major and minor oil companies uh, on the shelf. Uh, there are a lot of questions, and, and this was much faster than we expected, really. Uh, and, and, and these business models are, uh, are without uh, a, a public funding ask. So it's, uh, it's, it's driven by the, so the, the funding models in, in uh, other, uh, other European countries and, and the ETS system and, and, and the voluntary market for negative emissions and so on. So, and, and also hydrogen linked projects. Uh, and this has really been, uh, we've, we've been very surprised at how quickly this has moved. And, and it's, it's very exciting to see. Yes, thank you. Further questions, comments? No, oh, thank you uh, again. So that makes uh, uh, makes the time for the for the panel discussion. Um, and Olaf, maybe we could uh, collaborate on setting up that. <laughs> so I'll give the word to uh, Olaf Eja, senior advisor for climate and industry from Bellona, who will be uh, taking us through the panel discussion on perspectives on CCS as an emerging solution for reaching climate neutrality. Okay. Thank you, Maria. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think we can just begin by. Um, should we have the uh, so people can see the uh, the panelists? Uh, do you mind standing up uh, so that uh, not only the people in the room but also the people uh, sitting at home can uh, can see you? So we have a rather uh, rather broad topic, but I think. Um, <clears throat> for the purpose of uh, of uh, the overview and in the context of this uh, of this project, um, I wanted to ask uh, ask you if you could 
uh, begin by, um, uh, that means uh, Janneke, uh, Connie and Per, if you can begin by explaining briefly the, your, uh, your company, uh, its role in the, uh, in the Access project, and also what your company is, uh, is doing in the context of CCS and, uh, and uh, climate mitigation. Janneke Bjerkos from uh, Celsius, since you have the microphone, you may, uh, you may begin. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm representing Celsio, uh, and we are about to uh, build the first world's first uh, full-scale CCS project on a waste to energy plant in Oslo. Um, we have been developing this project since 2015 through studies, and we reached a final investment decision in June, and heading directly into construction phase. So our project or our plant will uh, start capturing CO2 in 2026 and delivering CO2 to the Northern Lights storage and uh, transport and storage chain. Um, during the feed phase, we built and operated a pilot plant to test the chosen technology with our specific flue gas at the Clemensru Waste to Energy plant. After testing our technology for nine months and 5,500 test hours with very good results, I might add, um, we then had a pilot that we uh, that was available for further development of the technology but also of other technologies and we were able to connect this with the access project to mod uh, to modify this pilot to test with another technology so we have just now finished the uh, the test phase uh, testing with the Cypems technology at our waste to energy plant and this pilot will then be, be uh, sent further for the next test test period uh, at TCM and then uh, Stora Enso and also Heidelberg. Thank you. Thank you, Janneke. And then uh, Connie Johansson from Stora Enso, uh, a bit about, because you have a, a bit of a particular uh, type of emissions because they are mostly biogenic, so uh, they're not really counted as, uh, counted as, uh, as, uh, as, as fossil CO2 in any case, but it uh, still goes into the atmosphere. So please explain what you are doing on, uh, on CCS. <laughs> What we are doing on CCL. <laughs> uh, Storenso is a pulp and paper company or timber company. Uh, we have uh, several billion of direct air capped installations on our land. We call them trees. <laughs> and then we take them to develop products uh, wooden houses, uh, the milk carton boards, uh, the corrugated boxes you all get home when you buy on the internet. Those are products that we do and we recycle them also. The, we have, in, for example, in Sweden, two of our six mills are totally without fossil fuels. And then we said, what is the next step? And then it's negative emission. That's why we are trying to catch up with those experts who have been working with it for decades, and we only a couple of years. So we are very pleased to be be invited to join this. And the pilot, when it comes to us, we will run it on a craft pulp recovery boiler, a chemical recovery reactor that we have, where we take the part of the tree and into the, into the boiler. And actually, if you look at point sources of biogenic carbon in Europe, I think that those, the 50 largest are all chemical pulp mills. So we, we, we talk about large point sources that could really do this with size, with scale, and things like that. So that's what we are bringing into this project. Mm. Thank you, Connie. Then uh, last uh, new, new panelist is uh, Per Breivik from uh, Heidelberg Cement or Heidelberg Materials, you call yourselves now, I, I have heard. Yes, uh, it was rebranding yesterday. <laughs> so it, it's quite new, but I saw the representative from the ministry had to catch it. So that was fine. Um, cement production, that's one of the main emitters. We emit 7 to 8% of the total emissions in the world every year. So we have a responsibility. It's much lower in other dependent on infrastructure, uh, the industrial structure, etc., etc. But on world basis, seven to eight percent of the emissions coming from the cement production. So we have a responsibility. But two thirds of it is coming from the process that you are that we are uh, heating up limestone, which is a source for the main main resource for the production. And at 900 degrees, the, the lime meal 
you have a calcination, then it's split between CIO, the, the, the limestone which we need in the production, and CO2. We emit half a ton of CO2 per ton of product. And that's unavoidable. And therefore, there, it was so important for us to start with the discussions on what can CCS do for the cement industry. That was the driver in the beginning. We started as an R&D project back in 2006, 2007, etc. So we have developed this in steps. And the key period for us was the testing of th four different technologies at our plant in Brevik uh, on our flue gas, that was really important. We can do a lot of testing, for instance, at TCM at Mongstadt. But if you are going to convince your owners, you have to do it on your own flue gas. That is, was so important. So 2013, 2017, we tested four different technologies. That was the basis, and that's still the basis of what we are doing in Breivik now. And we then developed, at the same time as, as uh, Celsio, the field studies, we gave an, uh, an offer to the, to the ministry, and uh, in 2020, Christmas start, it was on 21st of September. Then they, <laughs> de they decided that Norshell should be the capture part of the longship. But we have afterwards, we have the approval in Parliament. We start in uh, December 2020, we started building 4th of January 2021, and we are quite sure we managed to keep the the, the schedule and to deliver the first boat, the shipping, in the summer 2024. But we have started, it's a lot of challenges, we have learned a lot and we are discussing with and trying to give our experiences also to Celsius, to learn from, there are a lot of things we can do wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but we have started and we will be there and we hope to be one of the first, we will be the first in 2024, but Heidelberg actually today, we have 10 ongoing CCS projects, all over, the, most of them in Europe, but also an interesting project in, in um, Canada. Four of them was mentioned by, the, by Alex here, in, in Canada, UK, Sweden, in addition to the Norwegian project. So we hope to be a front runner, and we hope to deploy this further into the, in, in the group and in other cement producer, producers. So. Thank you, Bert. I, I know that you also uh, talk with lots of your colleagues in other, uh, in the Federation of Norwegian Industries, which represent uh, metals producers uh, and uh, uh, ammonia and, and uh, chemicals and, uh, and other products that uh, have the potential to drastically reduce their emissions by, uh, by way of, of CO2 capture and storage. But we also heard from the, uh, we have heard from, uh, heard from the Ministry of Petroleum and Energy now, and we heard from some, uh, for uh, the last couple of years that the Longship project is a, is a one-off project. Is there, uh, is there anyone following you in, uh, in Norwegian industry when it comes to CCS, or will do you be the first and last? I hope we are not the last one. But, uh, and I have discussed in the, in the same federation, I have mentioned where are the coming projects. And I'm so happy. We have a testing project in, in the northern part of Norway, in Muirana. They will do some testing now. That's really good. And maybe the most interesting and promising is what are going to happen in Eramet in Sauda on the western coast. They start to test now that, and they are really keen on doing this. And you, because you, you quite easy to understand if they mean it or if they, or if they are only the, we are waiting, we are waiting, we are doing something. You have to go on full, 100% into it. And I think Aramat is doing a really good job. That's interesting. Mm. Moving on to, to Sweden, Connie. Uh, is there any, uh, is there, or will there be any incentive for, uh, for Swedish emitters of, of fossil or biogenic CO2 to actually capture and, uh, and store their, uh, their CO2 anytime soon? In uh, Sweden, the government, oh, they took a decision last year. And decided to fund by more than three and a half billion euros for 15 years operation uh, up until two million ton of biogenic CO2. There are no discussion on fossil CO2 from, from the state, only from Heidelberg. Uh, and so that is the main, and that will be, um, sent, the, the money will be spent after reversed auctions. The, the cheapest uh, so storage solution will win the auction and 
get the funding for 15 years operation. And the first uh, auction is planned for early next year. Do you have any idea how much of, of Swedish capturable biogenic CO2 will that be able to cover? The 2 million ton is 80% uh, <laughs> because we have roughly 30 million ton of biogenic CO2 emitted in Sweden. And this is for 2 million ton. There is a forward plan uh, to maybe reach 10 million ton by 2045. Mm. So we'll see where, <laughs> how it kicks off and where it continues. But in Sweden, the focus is on bio CCS, mainly because there is no emission from uh, production of electricity or heat in, in fossil ways. And that's why you need to focus on something else. Uh, Janneke Bjerkos, your, uh, your waste incinerator, uh, the biggest one here in, uh, in, uh, in Oslo, emits about 50% uh, fossil CO2 and about 50% biogenic. Um, what do you think is the, uh, the best way to incentivize capturing also biogenic CO2 from waste incinerators around uh, Europe, of which there are several hundred and there might be even more since uh, we are supposed to reduce our landfills around Europe as well? That's right. So, and that's also why this project is so important to, to get realized, to demonstrate that it's, uh, it's possible to capture CO2 from, from waste to energy, and also with the bio CCS potential, the negative emissions. As you say, about 50% uh, of the CO2 that we emit from this process is biogenic. And this gives a huge potential for the waste to energy sector to contribute to providing negative emissions for Europe. Um, what we don't have today is a common framework and a legislation for how to, uh, how to count this, how to certify it, how to document it, and so on. And, and we know that the EU is working on this. There are some private initiatives and the private market, but we need a system for this to make sure uh, that uh, uh, the claiming of the removal is only counted once and that there are sustainable solutions uh, in, the, in the value chain, um, and also to certify that it's actually permanently removed from the atmosphere. Um, so hopefully this proposal from the EU that we will see in November will be um, uh, ready to start and to accelerate this process, because we know that there are a lot of waste to energy plants now um, uh, looking to us and starting their own projects both in Norway, in Scandinavia and in Europe. And waste to energy as, as cement is one of the major contributors to climate emissions from industrial processes. So we know that this is important to deal with the end of line solution and the emissions from the end of line solution for waste, not uh, as as a substitute to sorting and recycling and doing all the things we need to do with waste, but as an addition to, to deal with this last um, station for, for the residual waste. Mm. So what we need is legislation and framework, and um, we will also need to see that there is a cost combined with emitting fossil CO2 for all industrial processes in Europe. Uh, going back to uh, to Brussels, uh, Fabian Ramos from the European uh, European Commission. Um, I guess an economist would say that the easiest way to incentivize capturing biogenic CO2 would just to install a CO2 tax like the EU ETS or other forms of, of taxes. Is uh, is this something you have been considering as well, or are you still going to assume that biogenic CO2 is, is uh, carbon neutral and therefore it should not be taxed? Um, to, so, to be very clear first, uh, the initiative that we are developing this year is not so much about uh, the policies to put in place to support incentives, the development of, uh, of bags or of direct air capture or whatever, or the carbon removal solution, because it can be also an anthrop weathering, for instance, in the future. Today, of course, we there is very few projects, but maybe in the future there will be some technology breakthrough that will enable that. Now, today, it's really at the focus to be sure that when we talk about carbon removal, this is done the correct way. Uh, we will look after that on how we are, we, because we will need to do it. And it's not that we, want, we don't want to look at it or whatever, it's just we need to do things step by step. So first, we need so these common frameworks to be sure that we are all speaking the same language in terms of uh, carbon dioxide removals. And then uh, we will look at uh, how to adjust our climate policies to better support the development 
of um, of uh, carbon removals or uh, the phase out of uh, fossil in our industries, etc. Of fossil fuel, I mean, in our industry, etc. So um, I think it's a little bit early to say uh, how should we adjust the ETS system? Should we create something new? Should we? Some people will tell you, no, we have to put a, a carbon removal target for technological solutions, uh, and we should look at this very separately. You are mentioning taxes. There is many uh, different options, but it's a little bit too early to to di to discuss this, and it will come. Uh, soon because we are negotiating fit for 55 we are hopefully we will end this negotiation not too late and then after that it will be we have to get ready for 2040 for 2050 and it will be the time where we can start to discuss this mm. okay i then i wanted to to pick up on uh, on something that uh, i think also per wolf grandfist uh, if he's still on the uh, online um spoke about that and that is and that is the infrastructure, because um, we don't have any any uh, Danish speakers here today. But I, uh, it's only about a bit more than a, than a month ago that the um, uh, the waste incinerator in uh, Copenhagen, a company called ARC, um, they said that they will not be applying uh, for the Danish CCS funding that has been uh, that has been announced, um, despite the fact that this company has been one of the most vocal advocates for for CO2 capture and storage in, uh, in Denmark for the last uh, last couple of years. And they gave several reasons for, for that. But one argument that, that struck me was that they um, said that the, uh, the Danish support scheme, it puts the, uh, puts the funding on the table, but it puts all the responsibility for ensuring capture, transport and storage, including all the risks with the interfaces between the different parts of the chain, to put that risk on the, uh, on the emitter. And for them, that is, uh, that is highly problematic. Um, in part because, of course, they are not uh, uh, experts on all the parts of, uh, that are required in order to, to, uh, to transport CO2 all the way to uh, maybe several kilometers below the, uh, below the seabed. Um, but I don't know, Perulov, is, uh, is your, uh, in your dialogues with European industry, do you feel that they are, uh, are certain that, uh, that, the, that the technology will, uh, will work? Or uh, is, is the risk, risk aversion, is that, does that still, uh, still trump the motivation to, to invest in CO2 capture? It's not. It's not here. Okay. Um, in in that case, um, I, um, I wanted to to uh, to pass the word to to Peru, who has been working on the on this project uh, for uh, for a while. Is uh, what is what is the main risk? Is the financial risk of uh, of uh, having to pay upfront money for a CO2 capture plant, or is it the uncertainty of uh, of not knowing what's going to happen with your CO2? It's a really good question. But I, I was, f first I will say that. In the first round in Norway, the first time we discussed this in Norway with the ministry, etc., we had the Danish model. I was, I, I was challenged and said, Norsem, you shall take the responsibility for transport, talking with tr big ship companies. I didn't know anything about transport. Then talking about Statoil. Why should you start with the uh, storage, etc.? You don't know anything. No, that's correct. And we, we, we sent the, the message back to the, to the ministry. You can't organize it like that. And that was the solution how, how we came to the next step. And then I will say, maybe the, best, the most important takeaway from the long ship, that's establishing the infrastructure. We, m I'm sure we will manage to capture it and to condition it and then you need the others expert to take the transport and storage and then I'm sure this is possible to deploy much more than we are doing today. Yeah, okay. Yes, um, as many of you know already, Celsius has been realized uh, by a joint effort between the state, the city of Oslo and uh, the company Celsius with its new owners and I think uh, we need to realize that today CO2 is a waste product and it's combined with a cost to deal with this waste product. Uh, and I think it's impossible to, to put this responsibility entirely on the industry or the emission source, although it obviously needs to contribute to, to dealing with these emissions. So we need, I think we need to see a combination of um, incentives but also taxes it has to be combined with a cost to actually emit CO2. Uh, and this will obviously uh, drive the development, 
at the same time as volume will contribute to this technology being cheaper and more accessible. But as Per is also stating, the, the infrastructure must be in place for us to be able to send this CO2 off to storage uh, and uh, to do that in the most uh, cost-effective way. Uh, Mr. Eng from the Ministry. Thank you. Um, I, does this still work? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> From a, from a um, government perspective, uh, you'd like to see uh, you know, the market work or incentive models that are just you know, uh, cross-technology taxes uh, or, or cross-technology incentives. But what we saw with Longship was that we really need to go in with a very tailored approach and, and address those sort of value chain risks and, and take on board a lot of the risk. Um, from, from the industry actors uh, through the value chain. So, so the state is the counterparty uh, between Per and, and, and Jannica and the storage operator. So, so if the storage doesn't, uh, uh, isn't ready in time, then, then the state is liable uh, and we have to pay for their emissions. And this was, you know, we're never gonna do that again. Um, but it was necessary to develop uh, this infrastructure. And, 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 and this is where, when this infrastructure is developed and we see more infrastructure around the North Sea, you have a market that sort of is at least moving towards a, a more functioning market. And then you can apply a more sort of general, um, general incentive systems like taxes or, or, or sort of uh, like a model where you subsidize um, only the capture sites and, and, they, and they take the risk further down the chain and and that's that i mean that's where europe needs to uh to go uh, in a very short time i think and and what we're seeing in norway is that uh we're seeing the interest from from industry or from from the oil companies in developing uh these storages around the north sea and, and we think that we're approaching that market very soon Speaking of markets, uh, um, wanted to, to move on to something that has to do with the with the ownership. Uh, per Breivik was briefly uh, briefly touched upon this uh, this previously. The uh, the role of the owners in, in companies that uh, that uh, that could apply CO2 capture and storage to to reduce their emissions. Uh, I know that yesterday we had the uh, there was presented the climate budget for the city of uh, of Oslo. Uh, and I know that uh, the, uh, the Clemens City Waste Incinerator features heavily in there, and along with lots of other measures. But can I say something, Yannick, about the, the role of, uh, of, the, of the owners, including public owners, of, uh, of waste incinerators, which, is, which are often the, uh, the owners, both in, uh, in, uh, in Oslo and, and many other, elsewhere, uh, other places? Yeah, that's true. Waste to energy plants are usually uh, located near larger cities, where the heat can be utilized into the district heating system. And this, I think, is also an important point, especially with the energy situation that we see today, that we need to make sure to utilize all energy sources. And district heating can uh, take the pressure off the electricity grid, especially on high demand periods. So this is important that we actually utilize this, uh, this resource. Um, also, waste to energy plants are usually either the biggest or one of the biggest emission sources of cities. And that's the case for Oslo as well. 17% of the city's total emission stems from this plant. So by adding carbon capture to this process, uh, we can actually reduce the city emissions by 17%. And that's only the fossil part, obviously. So, so this is a huge uh, important, importance for cities in order to deal with their climate emissions and to reach their climate goals. And the city has been very clear on this, that they will not reach their climate targets without this CCS plant. And this is probably the case for a lot of other European cities as well. When it comes to the... Uh, and this also means that the cities may have to contribute to financing these projects. And looking at the cost of this, you could argue that um, CCS, very effective climate measure, and if you com uh, compare that to the cost of other climate measures in cities, the cost per ton, this is actually also a very cost effective measure. So that's, uh, I think, my main point. And then, of course, there are um, a lot of ways to finance these projects uh, when we look to the future. We see a developing carbon removal market that will be important for these plants. Uh, we will probably have some sort of a CO2 tax or a fee on the fossil part of the emissions. Norway has it, Sweden and Denmark has it, and several other countries as well. 
Uh, and then in addition, I think that we can also uh, think about whether it should be combined with the cost of also dealing with the CO2 emissions from the waste that you are producing, either from the industry or from households. That this is a part of the fee you will have to pay to treat your waste sustainably. A bit, of a, a bit of a teaser there for the next session as well, which is uh, also about CITES and, and CCS. But regarding markets, uh, Per Brevik, is, uh, is anyone, does anyone want uh, CCS cement? <laughs> good question, really good question. And uh, I've said a lot of times that when we are producing, we will produce 1.3 million tons of C CO2 cement, no, CCS cement per year. That's not the market. In the Norwegian market, total uh, uh, market is about 2 million tons of, of cement, etc. So we, we need to have followers. The next one. If we manage to build the plant in, uh, and do the same in the, at the plant in Slita, in Gotland, in Sweden, then the market, I think, will be there because that project is the double size of ours regarding the volumes, etc. Then you can compete with the others one. But we need... I, I think that... The cost of emitting, I'm sure, will increase further. The cost of capturing will have to reduce, but the two curves will meet. If they will meet at 100 euros per ton or at 120 or 130, I don't know, but they will meet. That, that I'm sure about that. And I think that the requirements from the authorities and from the society will be that huge emitters, they will not be allowed to emit as they have been doing before. You have to do something about your carbon footprint as a kind of, uh, of uh, uh, license to operate in the future. I'm, I'm sure, but I, we need followers, we need the other project because there will be a special situation when we have 1.3 million tons and <laughs> The, the, people, the people will ask for much, much, much more. It's huge interest. And I think some of them will pay for it, but there must be a market. In the, in the rest of, the, of, uh, of Heidelberg Cement, you mentioned that there's a bunch of other projects as well. Are these projects multi motivated by uh, public subsidies or by uh, demand or by investors, shareholders or others that, uh, that want these projects to, to materialize? I think investors is more and more interested in it, so it's a huge part of the capital market aid for Heidelberg materials, then we're discussing the, these uh, uh, possibilities. I think the sustainability has come in a uh, central position in Heidelberg cement, and the top management is very focused on the sustainability, how, how we can perform in the future, and that starting point is Europe. But of course, we see the North, North America, etc., the interest for this is very much more, but I don't think there are very many places where you can have, have the same funding as when the Norwegian government said we are going to see, sit in the front seat to do something by the CCS. Hmm. Um, we could take a short, not that break, but uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, one question, two questions in the back? Okay, I can uh, walk around the mic. A uh, question for the State Secretary. <laughs> this week, the uh, Biden administration, Secretary of Transportation, announced a formal policy for preference in procurement for projects in the federal government for low-carbon materials. And this will cover 98% of their purchases of cement, steel, and so on. Are you considering something similar? First of all, uh, thank you for elevating my uh, my status uh, slightly. Uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, 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 I'm only a bureaucrat uh, and not a, not a politician. Uh, but I had the CCS section on, on the uh, among the bureaucrats. Um, I, I think uh, um, public. And the U.S. I mean, it's it's very interesting uh, what's what's going on in the U.S. with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the and the direct incentives, uh, the tax incentives for for CCS. And um, my understanding is that uh, uh, their expectations that what they're doing there with the incentives will, will uh, result in 200 million tons of uh, stored CO2 annually from 2030. Um, and, that, and that's uh, I mean that's that's a very sort of general uh, market-based model. Uh, 
you get a tax uh, tax credit uh, for every ton of CO2 that's stored. Um, so, so that that's one interesting aspect. And then uh, public procurement, I, I think that's that's a very eff could potentially be a very efficient tool, uh, and it's something that's. Uh, it, it it should be on on governments and, and politicians' uh, radar. Uh, that that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. Hello, I'm uh, Helena Mer, and I represent Carbonor. And I just wanted to say because someone asked what CCS projects are coming, we are actually coming, and we are uh, we finished our uh, testing uh, with our partner in Poland in June. And then we sent the pilot, the test unit up to Moirana <laughs> after us. So we actually are in these days receiving our report on how we did. And it looks very promising. We are going to capture CO2 on the production of uh, carbon reductant materials for the process industry. And we are actually moving a Polish plant to Norway. And we are moving it right next to Northern Lights uh, CO2 reception facility up in Eugaren uh, municipality. So what we are doing is uh, we have a biogenic source and we have a fossil source of CO2. And capturing CO2 on the fossil source is easier than on the biogenic source because the fossil source generates much more energy and we need a lot of energy to capture CO2. And I think um, this is where I want the, the ministry also to hear this, that it's a very important issue with the energy, the lack of energy that many industries will have when they try to find solutions to carb capturing uh, CO2. Because um, when we make biogenic uh, carbon reductants, the process in itself sort of eats all the energy, or most of it. So we don't have so much left for us to fuel the carbon capture units. And this, if there were any opportunities for us, we don't receive any funding. We've received two projects from Gasnova, but that's it. So we are trying to make a commercial business model. And I think uh, this energy problem is one of the most important uh, thresholds for industry to be able to do carbon capture, uh, but especially doing uh, carbon removal because we don't completely combust our biogenic raw material. We, complete, we, we, we need to leave some energy in it for our users. So there we have a problem when we look at the business model, how do we make it profitable or even possible to do a CO2 capture on the biochar? So uh, it's, it's not a question, it's more of an information point and I think it's very important uh, to look at this, especially now when energy prices are very high and there is no such thing as stranded heat anymore uh, at the industry plants. Thank you. Does anyone, anyone want to respond to that uh, comment slash question or? Uh? Yeah, I can very quick, uh, quick response. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, it's a very interesting project and I, I, I hope it's the next one. So that, that, that's great. Uh, with the energy situation, uh, it's a very challenging time for, uh, for all of Europe. Uh, and and, and uh, hopefully we can you know, find, uh, find solutions uh, to this, I mean, th this is driven by the by the, you know, the, the, the war in, in, in the Ukraine uh, and the lack of gas uh, to Europe. So uh, it, it's it, hopefully a short term short term issue, uh, and I think we need to work together and, and uh, w with the Commission on, on how to address uh, that general problem. Janneke? Yeah, I think that's. Energy demand in general, and of course, especially with the situation we have today, is a challenge with capture technology. So this is definitely an area where we will need to see development to reduce the energy demand on the capture process. Both with the current technology that both uh, PER and, and the, uh, our project has chosen, Amin technology, but also for the uh, evolving processes. For example, the te uh, technology that we have been testing 
or will be testing in the access project. Uh, in our work, we have done an uh, energy integration study. We have our craft pulp mill. We have one million ton of biogenic CO2, enormous amount of energy. We, we thought that, oh, of course, we can take waste heat from our plant to the capture plant, or there is waste heat in the capture plant that we can use. And we, we looked for four different mature technologies, and no one matched. A total failure, but also very good information that we need to look further. How can we find technologies that are using less energy or other temperatures? So it's in possible to be integrated into our technologies. And then I have to add again that uh, <laughs> this is another good match with waste to energy, actually, because with the district heating system, we can utilize the excess heat from the capture process. So investing in, uh, by investing in a large heat pump, we are actually uh, reutilizing the heat from the, from the stripper uh, back into the district heating system and thus utilizing this, uh, this heat. So that's a good match. Thank you. Uh, we're going to round off this discussion, but I wanted to ask, ask uh, Fabian Ramos in Brussels one last question. With your work on the, on the sustainable carbon cycles uh, um, and the, hopefully the, the clarity that will give uh, when it comes to, uh, to those who will be working with, uh, with carbon dioxide removal, um, and based on your conversations with, uh, with industry and others who work with this, do you think that, uh, that, uh, that your work will make it, uh, will make it easier for them to, uh, to actually, or more confident that they should start work uh, and invest in, in carbon dioxide removal already now? Yes, this is really what we, we try to achieve with this initiative. And, and also with the communication on sustainable carbon cycle, we are too very clear that we, uh, we, want, we wanted to, to, to really present our vision and to show to uh, stakeholders to reassure that all these industry or to yeah, reassure all these industries and uh, all people that uh, we are very much aware that we need this CCS technology, that we need to do carbon dioxide removal and in big quantities. So it was um, uh, really for us important. And then, as I said before, the next step is uh, we want to put in place this framework. And I think this is also a, a very clear signal that by working on this framework on how to correctly account for carbon removal, avoid double, uh, double counting, and uh, look at sustainability issues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we 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 want to get ready for the integration of um, of carbon removal in our uh, if, if in the future in our policies. And I think this is a kind of signal that uh, industries uh, need. Of course, they want uh, always that we go faster, 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 but. Uh, uh, we, we need to be also very careful what we, with what we do. And, uh, and the communication that will come next year will be, again, another step and another uh, signal to be sent. And then in 2044, I think, uh, we will probably come with the 2040 strategy. So what we have done uh, for Fit for 55 and before that, uh, the climate target plant where we set the, the new target for 2030. Uh, in 2024, we are going to start this new cycle for 2040. Yeah, having in mind 2040, and then will come the new policy, etc. So uh, it will not stop. We'll continue toward uh, this direction. I think we have already sent very clear signal, and uh, we are going to to continue that and to be clearer and clearer on this. And and then the, the, the industry can get the certainty that uh, uh, investing in in CCS is the way to go for the future. Thank you. I think we have time for one small question, not a comment, but a question. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ingborg from Sintef Energy, and uh, I just wanted to pick up on something that Janneke said, that we need regulations, um, and also something that you said, uh, Fabian, that we are in the progress of getting these regulations, but it's uh, time-consuming and we have to test it and so on. Uh, so my question is, is it a game-stopper for the industry that there is no regulations in place? And do we have time to, to wait for testing everything thoroughly before it's sort of up and running? For us, it's not a <laughs> game stopper that there is no regulation because we believe that that will come. And if the Commission want to have some reference discussions, we are all very delighted to be of help. So. Um, 
I don't think it's a game stopper, but it's definitely uh, delaying it, I think. I think we definitely need this um, uh, common framework. We, we have the, the private market and it is developing, uh, but it's the, it's the issues that, that uh, Mr. Ramos mentioned with the, the ensuring single counting and sustainability and, and the permanent removal and so on, that we will need some overarching structure to, uh, to account for. So um, I sincerely hope that we will, uh, as soon as possible, see some common framework to, to move forward on. Yes, it can delay it, but I don't, I, I don't think it will because there are enough crazy people saying we are going to do this, and that's more important. <laughs> Well, uh, let that be the last word of the, of the discussion. Thank you very much to the, uh, to the panelists uh, that are physically here and, uh, and virtually as well. And uh, back to you, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> Before we go uh, uh, break for the break, <laughs> uh, I have a message from my colleague, Christine. Uh, for those of you that did not re register, please do that before you take your coffee. And it's important also that you sign... Uh, or I would like you to sign that you accept that we are um, recording this. <laughs> uh, so please, um, coffee is in, uh, outside.
climate target.
Long yeah. I think it's time to start again, yeah? Before I start off the session, just one small note from the organizers. The main door outside is working again, so if everyone, anyone needs to leave during the session, you can use the main door. Okay, well, um, today, first of all, my name is uh, Hendrik Frieling. I work for the Fraunhofer Institute for Industrial Engineering, uh, based in Stuttgart, Germany. And I'm also uh, the research coordinator of the Morgenstadt Initiative. It's an interdisciplinary initiative combining research businesses and city administrations. So I have the pleasure to talk today about yeah, climate neutral cities and the approaches that we need to it, need for it. And first of all, I would like to take a small step back and see what are cities facing today. So there are several challenges and opportunities that cities need to deal with um, and that are very urgent in an urgent need to be tackled. First of all, whoops, I think we have, ah, okay, you see the next one, I see already the next slide, okay. <laughs> we have some trends that all cities need to address. Um, first of all, we have the trend um, of urbanization, uh, we have the trend of climate change, and we have new opportunities coming up uh, with the need for digitalization. So what does this mean in detail? First of all, we know that urbanization worldwide is going up. It's predicted to reach 65% uh, of all people living in urban areas by 2050. And we know that there is a multitude of issues connected to it. There's a rise in traffic, there is air pollution, there are the problems of energy supply. This is why it's very much needed that urban planners already now turn their attention to these issues. Secondly, and I'm not telling something new here because it's the topic of the day, we have the issue of climate change. It's posing a major threat to all societies across the globe. Um, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is continuously increasing. In fact, it has reached the highest monthly average in April this year with 420 parts per million. And it's increasingly be being felt across, across the globe in forms of drought, um, extreme weather events, glacier melt and ocean rising. But that is not even worth enough. We are also not yet on track for the global targets. We have stated big global targets in form of the Paris Agreement to limit the uh, industrial emissions uh, to stay in the scope of 1.5 degrees. So far, we are not on track for that. Um, it looks more like doubling this number. So we need to address this. One way to address this is to digitalizing our cities. It's a profound dynamic that enables groundbreaking innovations. It allows for new services, it allows for new business models. Um, we know that digital infrastructure is already a fundamental component of most urban societies. We can analyze data, um, we can collect data sets. First, they are segregated. When we establish combined data ecosystems, then uh, we can use, make use of them by means of planning and foresight, and we can create smart cities for the benefit of all its residents. With smart cities, we have major increases in resource efficiency. Uh, they are possible through the use of information and communication technology, especially uh, when looking at the heating of buildings, uh, when looking at smart street lights, there is the option of smart demand and supply management. So here, major reduction in emissions are possible, while of course being aware of the risk related to data protection issues. So then, climate neutrality, how do we get there? Well, I think it's very clear that we do need planning strategies around smart and sustainable urban development. They are the key to addressing some of the most pressing challenges. This includes, of course, uh, investment in smart and green infrastructure, but it also includes addressing uh, the emissions that are related to mobility habits um, and our consumption patterns. So, and lastly, of course, there's also a need to increase technological mi mixes um, in order to promote resource efficiency. In all of these approaches, I would argue from a social science perspective, it's key to take the citizens on board. It's key to take the citizens with us um, in the climate neutral transition. Especially now, we've talked about it today already, we have the current ongoing um, cr uh, crisis in terms of energy supply, and there are many fears connected to it for the average citizen. So we sh should listen to them, and we should make sure that we have them on board for this urgently needed transformation. 
So what can we do from a perspective of sustainable urban development and urban system research? Well, it's very important to look at the different scales and sectoral interrelations that we have in the city. We need to sh check for each sector, whether it's on the city level, on the regional level, quarter level or building level, what role does it play in the urban system, how much does it emit, what are the inter sectoral interrelations between um, those that occur here, and when we examine these at different scales, and most importantly, how can we improve them, uh, each sector, in terms of climate efficiency. Climate efficiency, of course, leads us again to the topic of emissions. We know that crucial emitting sectors are the energy, road, transport and industry sectors, and we know also that there are already advances being made through technological innovations in those sectors. And industry, from a climate perspective, we've heard it today multiple times, is very, very relevant. It produces goods and essential raw materials for climate action in other sectors, so we need it. We need the basic materials, uh, such as cement, as we've heard. We need steel, we need the chemicals um, for the climate technologies. So we have a large emitter, however, it is not usually in the hand of public actors. So for cities, it might be more difficult to address these emissions directly. So I think we need to address this gap um, in order to overcome this issue. So how can it be overcome? One way forward, I would argue, um, are multi-stakeholder approaches for sustainable urban development. That means bringing all relevant actors to the table, be it the cities, be it the research, and um, be it the business and industry. I see the role of research here as really tying together the knots, yeah, putting forward the methods, the tools, and design processes um, to establish these projects. Because all of these actors, they can bring their specific strength to the table, and when we connect them, we can really go a big step forward in towards climate neutrality and also pioneer innovation projects um, for livable and inclusive cities. I think it's an aspect that's very imminent, that's very clear in the Access project. I think we're trying to do that, and I think it's a good way to go forward, and it's also what we try to do um, in all the projects of the Morgenstadt Initiative. So, what is the role of CCS here? I'm just going to talk very briefly about it, because we will have here more discussions about this later on in the panel, and I don't want to take away too much. We know already, and we've heard throughout the day, that um, it's a crucial technology, sorry, you can see the slide, a crucial technology to fight climate change and to limit greenhouse gas emissions. We have heard the data suggests, and it's clear, we cannot reach our targets without CCS. Cities on the other hand, they have local ties to utilities and industry. Yeah, and they should make use of those ties. We have municipal waste to energy plants, we have power plants in our cities. And we now know that the long-term benefits are considered to outweigh the high initial uh, investment costs and can reduce also the cost for everyone else who is up to follow. Knowing all that, what is needed then for cities, and I, oops, there's something missing here. Let's see. Uh, it should start this way. Okay. I want to show this article here because um, CCS still has a reputation issue. It's a very recent New York Times article and demonstrates that it's still frequently tied to the accusation of prolonging the life of the fossil fuel industry and thus be a tool for greenwashing. So we need to overcome this perception and there are multiple ways of doing that. I hope that the slide now works. Yes, it does. Um, what we need is transparency on CCS performance. Um, the, uh, yeah, transparency on CCS performance in mitigating climate change. We need transparency on the sectors that we want to address and insist on its use, usage for climate mitigation in uh, sectors where emissions cannot be avoided otherwise. Of course, we've heard before we need sustained research and development to achieve lower costs to make it more widespread. And again, from a societal perspective, I would argue we need more information um, th about CCS through citizen education to drive its social acceptance. When we do all of this, when we do all of this by means of these multi-stakeholder initiatives, looking at the different sectors, then I think we can really make use of its full potential. At the end, I want to state cities are made of the people who live in it, 
the citizens. Cities are a political sphere, so again, we need to take the needs and concerns of the general public into account when putting forward these kind of new innovative technologies. When we do all of this, I think we can really make use of the full potential of CCES for climate neutral urban development. I want to leave it at that for an opening talk. I'm looking very forward to the discussion we have afterwards and also to the city speakers that will now introduce the climate panels. Thank you very much. First of all, are there any questions from the round? No questions so far. Yes, Ingeborg. Oh, you need a mic. Uh, so just a very quick uh, question for me. Uh, you already touched upon it, that we need city education to, mm. to get the population on board. Uh, do you have any examples of sort of successful city education, mm -hmm. or citizen ed education? Well, as the topic, I don't need <laughs> as the topic it's, is uh, new also for us at Fraunhofer to work with, we, I think we first of all need to establish the education materials. Um, but it is shown in other fields of controversial topics that one, when you go transparent, when you are clear about the goals that you set, uh, and inform the uh, general public from the outset. And I think it's very important to do it from the outset of projects. What is the impact? Well, how, how can it um, establish climate neutrality? Then we can get everybody on board. Because otherwise you have <laughs> influences in public opinion that, you cannot, that are hard to control. Um, and we need to go in front of the public opinion, so to say, to yeah, set the scene. Thank you. If there are no further questions at the moment, then I would like to give the word now to our city speakers. We have three European city climate plans from Oslo, Zurich and from the port of Gothenburg. And we will start today with Mr. Einar Wilhelmsen, sorry, Vice Mayor for Finance of the city of Oslo. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, I think there was a grammatical error in that uh, headline you, you showed about uh, CCS. For, because from my perspective, every dollar spent is on waste and CCS. <laughs> so I'll get back to that. Well, um, there are many aspects of uh, Oslo's climate policy. One of them is to have integrated mobility. So uh, uh, yesterday I um, put forward the budget for next year for the uh, city of Oslo. It's uh, nine billion uh, crowns, uh, sorry, euros, 90 billion crowns. And it also my budget also includes a climate budget, which I will talk a bit about. However, that became a very long night. Uh, and uh, therefore, I didn't bike home. I took uh, the metro because part of our integrated system is so that you can take your bike on the metro for free outside of rush hour. A very nice system. However, that had its unforeseen consequence that I went home uh, with my shoes that I usually have on, on my job. So uh, today I'm here in my bike shoes because my proper nice shoes are at home. So, so, uh, so, th so th there is a dark side of integrated mobility, I think. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I am the vice mayor for finance in the city of Oslo. Uh, this summer I met a colleague in, in Hamburg, and they actually call the, uh, they are not uh, vice mayor, they are, they are senators, which I believe is even nicer. Uh, however, um, <coughs> however, um, uh, I am in charge of uh, Oslo's uh, financial policy, our procurement policy, and also our climate budget, and that is why I'm here today. Uh, because we are indeed living in scary times. Uh, we are now seeing... Uh, climate changing around us. We are experiencing very dry weather here in Oslo. We have uh, been asking citizens to be very careful with the use of water. Uh, we have very little water in the reservoirs providing hydropower. We have seen drought in, uh, in southern uh, Europe. I have a, a German friend who visited her parents in Freiburg, I think, uh, this summer, and she told me that uh, the apple tree that her parents planted when she was a child, it, it had died because uh, there was no water in the ground. Uh, so we are starting to see climate change. 
And on the other side of the globe, in, in Pakistan, you have the worst drought, no, no, sorry, uh, flood catastrophe I have ever seen. Uh, so, so, uh, so it's really dramatic, and it underlines the importance of, of uh, climate policy. Uh, our overall climate policy is um, uh, adapted by the, by the city council uh, in 2020, and it sets certain very uh, strong emissions. The first one and the most important one is we are, we are trying to reduce our emissions within the city of Oslo by 95% by 2030. So that means basically zero emissions. But we also have some targets for climate resilience because we are seeing now climate changes uh, and more extremes, more dry weather, but also more rain. When, and when it comes, it comes much, much more uh, all at once. And we get flooding in the city. Um, we also have plans for forest and land use, and we want to manage our land so that we can absorb more car carbon. Um, we want to reduce our energy use, which suddenly became much more important now when, uh, 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 with the Russian invasion in, uh, in Ukraine and the use of uh, energy as a weapon. Uh, and we are trying to reduce our indirect emissions, so we also have a target for that. But most of our ambitions within the city of Oslo are directed at our emissions within the city. Uh, and when I say our, I mean all of Oslo's inhabitants. Uh, so, so that's a sort of a scope one. To do that, uh, we have a climate budget. And then I can show you my one slide. Here is the climate budget. It is actually a huge cap chapter in my budget. Uh, and when we have... Uh, when we decide on the budget and when you have the, uh, the two annual large budget conference with the rest of the city council, uh, we also discuss uh, emissions. Uh, and uh, the climate budget is a tool for managing uh, our emissions uh, and a tool for, for steering us on the way to 95%. And I will, I will get a bit back to it. But um, it's scope one, so it's all the emissions within, uh, or coming from the city of Oslo or the municipality of Oslo. And this graph shows the effect of all the calculated climate measures that we can calculate the effect of. And the green line is the official statistics of emissions from Oslo. And it's the same data set that we use when we report on our emissions to the European Union and to, uh, to um, uh, the UN. So it's the same numbers. Um, the climate budget is a tool, a policy tool, and it specifies, it, it, it presents climate measures, then it calculates the effect of the measure. Uh, and then it specifies who is supposed to carry that out, when and how, and then that entity has to report on the progress. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if, we, if, we, if it wasn't allowed to have your bike on the metro uh, after rush hour, and we thought that would have a climate effect, we, would, we could say in this budget that now we are introducing that measure. We think that it will reduce emissions a little bit because people won't take a taxi. Uh, and we can include that effect here. And we think that uh, the, uh, the, the, the vice mayor for, for transport will be responsible, or, for, or one of her uh, um, entities. And then uh, they will carry it out. And then uh, they will report back when it's done and how it worked. And the reporting follows the normal budget reporting. So I get two budget reports. I get one with money and one with climate. And that works very well because it, uh, it gives uh, the climate work as much, what's the English word? Uh, importance as the financial budget. And uh, yes, so... Um, So, uh, now more about that climate budget, because this is sort of the core of our climate policy. Uh, and I forgot to say earlier that uh, my city council, we are three parties ruling together. The Green Party, which I'm from, the Social Democrats, and, uh, and the Socialist le Social Social List Left Party. Uh, and sort of our overall ambition is that we want to provide work for everyone. We want to redistribute wealth, and we want and we have focus on reducing our climate emissions. 
in line with the Paris Agreement. So, so climate is at the core of, of, uh, of this city government, and it, it is one of the top three things on, the, on our political agenda. So, and that sort of highlights how important it is, and this is the main tool for reaching that goal. And of course, uh, for us, climate policy sort of includes all kinds of aspects of, uh, of ruling this city. It's, there are aspects of climate policy within education, of course, within our transport policy, in uh, our land management policy, in uh, our waste management policy, of course, uh, in our water and wastewater treatment policies, and in our and when we regulate new uh, housing or new areas for, for something, climate is also at the center. And, and this uh, tool helps us doing that, because with a climate budget, and when you put all the climate measures you have into a projection, you can all see that we are not reaching the target. So this is a very sobering thing. Uh, this budget shows that with the climate budget I proposed uh, yesterday, we will be on this line and we will probably reach 62% reductions by 2030 <laughs> with new measures which we have identified but not yet put into action we could come to 79 and we still have some work to do however our learning is that by doing systematic climate work we are able to push this line downwards every year so if I had last year's climate budget you would see that I would be slightly further away from reaching the 2030 target. Uh, so, and that is because we are, all, we are able from year to year to develop new measures and to tighten those we have in order to, uh, to reach the target. So what are the measures? Well, there are, of course, all kinds of things. Uh, in this year's budget, we integrated some huge new measures which will give dramatic effects. One is here. In my financial budget, I have now secured funding for CCS at our waste treatment plant at Clemetsrud. And that causes this bump here. Um, that plant will, uh, will, uh, will take around 400,000 tons of CO2 out of the air, or will not be emitted into the air. Uh, rather, it will be stored in the ground in, uh, in the North Sea uh, when this uh, plant is finished. So. Um, so, uh, so that is one of the most important climate measures in this budget. It's more important than it seems, because we are burning waste. And in my climate budget, I'm only calculating the fossil uh, CO2, which is roughly half. So that other half is also taken out and stored into the sea, but I don't count it in the budget. So actually, this line should be a bit further down um, here somewhere, if I counted the CO2 coming from, uh, from, uh, from biomass. But we think that would be cheating. But still, for the climate, it doesn't matter. It's less CO2 emitted. Other important measures uh, put into action with the budget I proposed yesterday was uh, lower prices for public transport, increased taxes for uh, fossil cars in the toll ring around Oslo. That toll ring is a very, very important climate tool. We think that by increasing the fees for driving into the city, we will reduce city's emissions by 5% next year. Uh, so that is a very important, uh, uh, important um, measure. However, uh, in this budget there are a, a wider range of, of, uh, of transport measures. I mentioned in, uh, lower prices for, uh, for the public transport, increased taxes in the toll ring, but we are also changing parking fees. It will be more expensive to park in the city centre and, uh, and cheaper to park in the outskirts of the city. Uh, um, but um, that also makes, uh, however, a lot of uh, parking in, in the outer skirts of the city is free today. So what we are actually introducing is a way for the local municipalities to, to, uh, to introduce something called uh, citizen parking, which gives parkings to those who live there and introduces a fee for, for, uh, for people coming from elsewhere and parking. Uh, so basically it's a plan for... Uh, uh, for uh, introducing parking fees in areas that are free to park in today. So it will have, uh, have uh, an effect on, on mobility. Uh, yesterday's budget also contained a huge, huge investments into energy uh, savings and solar uh, energy in the city of Oslo. Um, that will have no effect on my climate budget because it only counts 
uh, scope one emissions within the city of Oslo, or we don't have any fossil uh, power production, or uh, not really any fossil district heating production either. However, in a broader sense, of course, reduced energy consumption will reduce emissions uh, in, in, on a European scale, because we are well connected with the European power grid. I think that was my time, so thank you. Questions? Are there any sorry? Any questions for Mr. Willemsen? I don't see any. Are there any online? No. And I thank you very much for your talk and very interesting insights into the climate budget as a very important tool, I think, for reaching climate neutrality. Thank you. Thank you. Then as the next speaker, I would like to introduce Mr. René Estermann the Director of Environmental and Health Protection from the City of Zurich. René, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to Oslo. And um, yeah, I'm pleased to uh, give a second uh, picture of a city climate plan, a net zero plan from Central Europe part um, from Zurich. Um, as you know, Switzerland is a, a, a direct democracy, so such uh, important topics like the climate target, um, we vote for it. And we had a referendum on the net zero strategy just a few months ago after the city council and after the city parliament um, decided for the net zero plans um, we even had the full population which voted, and you see, it's uh, approved strongly, uh, three quarters approved these um, ambitious plans. How did we come to this uh, climate neutrality um, plan and strategy 2040? and what it contains, and what, are, um, what is the importance of CCS within these plans, I will show you uh, further. I don't go deeper in the mitigation activities, but I, I give you uh, an outlook um, what type of uh, CCS activities uh, these plans will include. Um, but first to the plan, um, as Einar before showed you, um, net Zero 2040 is focused mainly on these um, territorial emissions in the territory of Zurich, and that's only a quarter of our emissions. Huh? Mobility, heating, waste in incineration, most of the emissions are abroad. When I came here to Oslo to the conference, I generated emission through my uh, transports with my flights here. Um, when we consume food, it's not food of Zurich, it's produced outside, um, some in Switzerland, some in Italy, some in uh, Central Europe, wherever, and we, we are responsible for these indirect emissions. So direct emissions, indirect, and the focus we have for becoming net zero is focusing these so-called direct emissions um, this follows this territorial principle like the countries do their uh, reporting. And here you see the sources of our emissions, the dark blue ones, the direct emissions. We have the um, building heating emission, that's the, the major part, more than half of these direct emissions. Else than here in Oslo, we have still in Switzerland, we use a lot of fossil uh, fuel for heating, it's 70% uh, of our heatings in the city, it's with natural gas, it's with uh, fossil oil. This we have to replace, and then the city's mobility as well. We dream from um, such immobility like we have here in Oslo. We are far away from that, but I can show you afterwards we are far further with the mobility mix. In Zurich you will see we use much more public transport, much more pedestrian and uh, bike, so we have less, much less cars to electrify 
in Zurich. And then you see the waste incineration. Huh? It's uh, relevant, more than half a ton. It's the same size as at Celsius, the 400,000 tons in absolute numbers that we emit with our incineration plant there. And then you see all the indirect emissions. And of course, that's the focus where we are going. And here you see the net zero plan. Net zero means that. Reduce the direct emissions to almost zero. And with CCS and removals, then we offset the rest that there will be from the incineration and some agriculture. Um, residues. And perhaps what's special in Zurich, we have as well quantitative targets for the indirect emissions, minus 30% compared to 1990. That means minus 40% compared to today, indirect emissions. So as well there, city want to set measures uh, for the reduction of the indirect emissions. Um, I don't go deeper in these mitigation activities, but you will have them in the presentation. Have a look on it, how we decarbonize the heating, how we decarbonize the mobility. I go further to the um, CCS. Perhaps only that, huh? the, mo the model split, the mobility mix that we have in town. Um, I saw here in Oslo, it's still around almost 40%, 35%, a, a third cars in town, we are on the way towards 20% cars of the mobility mix and we want to have a one-digit number in 2030, less than 10% um, traffic by cars. So we really want to shift the mobility in town because it takes too much space. We don't have as much space as uh, here in Norway. So we have to use it uh, much more efficient, the rare space in town, than for huge roads. So going to these carbon capture and storage um, activities and projects that we want to set in place, there is one very relevant, and it's the CCS at the incineration plant. There are a few others, which I show you much um, smaller activities, but as well relevant activities, um, like using more wood. We heard the bio-based um, materials usage from uh, Raphael, what was its name? No, oh, Fabian, Fabian told about it. So, uh, of course, that usage in the building sector, use more bio-based materials like wood, will capture as well and reduce emission and capture CO2. At the end, we want to capture and uh, remove half a ton per capita um, of inhabitant. And here you see our incineration uh, plant. It's the biggest one in Switzerland. All over Switzerland, there are around 30 incineration plants, and there is a, a national plan that all these incineration plants to um, move Switzerland's climate neutrality until 2050. The national target is 2050, zero, net zero. All these 30 installations all over Switzerland have to apply CCS um, activities. Within the next five to 10 years, there will be a first, just uh, a smaller one. And uh, in Zurich, we intend as fast as possible, but we think it will not be in the 20s, it will be beginning of the 30s that we can realize the CCS at our um, incineration plant. And the same as here, it's the 50% accountants then for removal and the rest is fossil based. This will be a mitigation activity. All over Switzerland, we then account these five to 10 million tons from the incineration plants and the, the cement industry, which we have to store. And we don't have storage capacity in Switzerland. There is no gas, no oil industry. We need the partners in the north, perhaps in the south as well. Cari amici del sud, ci sono anche Cooperazione per, per il sud. <laughs> um, what we do is 
with our sewage plant in Zurich, you see here west of Zurich our wastewater treatment plant. We have there a centralized um, sludge management and within the next three to five years we want to capture there uh, the CO2 in the um, sludge uh, treatment. That will be the first um, CCS activity. What we intend is um, a storage within the urban construction material. Already nowadays, almost all the concrete which is um, collected from replacement, restore of the buildings is recycled. And by recycling the concrete, we can use CO2 or store their CO2 in the recycled concrete. This we will extend a lot. There are already um, activities for a few hundred, a few thousand tons with these installations. Then there will be a size of, of a few 10,000 tons that can be used in the construction sector. Um, another activity that was realized this year by our energy um, company of Zurich, E360, together with the sugar industry, it's a, a biomass uh, pyrolysis installation in Frauenfeld. That's the place where one of the Swiss sugar factories there, um, out of 25,000 tons of uh, residual wood, wood chips, um, they produce biochar uh, in a pyrolysis process, um, district heating, and um, renewable uh, power out of that. And there we have uh, 10,000 tons of CO2 removals from the 3,500 tons of biochar. And the biochar we use as well um, of course, in agriculture, in gardening, um, together with the Institute of Ecological Farming, the FIBEL, um, we do some research in application of biochar, how much biochar is applicable in several soils, in several cultures, how it works, how is the long-term removal, how is the permanency, and so on. All these questions that are told there. And then the fifth um, project, CDR project, is the usage uh, in the building sector, in the construction check sector, the use of more wood to uh, uh, the building stock, how we can apply more than that from that. So this gave you a short insight about our strategy, about our goals and uh, five storage um, or CDR topics and projects that we apply in Zurich. Looking forward to your questions and the discussion afterwards. Yes, are there any questions for René from the audience? A moment, online question. Okay, uh, then we will go on to the next. There is oh, one. there's one. I'm sorry. Okay, then we will hand over the microphone. Thank you, uh, Ryan Hubala from uh, Acker Carbon Capture. Thank you for uh, the ambition uh, turning uh, City of Zurich carbon neutral by 2040. Um, so if there are other places in Europe which are far away from injection uh, storage sites, um, which are all offshore and most of them at the moment in the North Sea. Is there any ambition uh, from Zurich, Switzerland, and other countries in the same kind of geographical configuration to look at onshore storage? Um, yes, if there is option for onshore storage, there is an open um, access, of course. Uh, everybody who can deliver storage capacity um, can apply for, for Swiss uh, providers or yeah, Swiss uh, capture um, uh, producers. But in Switzerland, we, we have a, a few research programs. Um, I don't think that, that it will generate a lot uh, of capacity within Switzerland uh, because there is no um, uh, skill 
of oil and gas generation in Switzerland, and I don't think that there will be a, a huge capacity in the country. But if there are other opportunities in Germany, in the eastern countries, wherever, it's open, the field, of course. Thank you very much, René, for those insights. And then next, I would like to ask Tina Marlent from the uh, project manager from the port of Gothenburg to give us insights from Gothenburg. Yes, hello. Um, I will start with a movie before I'll begin. But otherwise, thank you for inviting us. Just one sec. In order to meet our global climate targets, we have to find faster ways of reducing the greenhouse effect. With Simfracap, we prevent about 4 million tonnes of carbon dioxide from reaching the atmosphere every year. In order to get there, we're already planning for efficient infrastructure all the way from plant to quayside. This means that several CO2 capture plants will be interlinked with the port. Carbon dioxide is transported by pipeline, road or rail to the port of Gothenburg. From the carbon capture site and short-term storage facility, the CO2 is then loaded onto ships for transport to the permanent storage site. Here, it is pumped several thousand meters below the seabed into deep caverns in the bedrock. Over time, the liquid carbon dioxide is transformed into a solid. Simfracap will become operational by 2026. The plant, located in the port of Gothenburg, will be open to the whole of Sweden for shipment of captured CO2 for permanent storage. Mm. Hello everyone, my name is Tina Marlind and I represent the port of Gothenburg, but of course also my colleagues from our collaboration companies. And uh, thank you for inviting us. We're very humble in uh, knowing that we're a small part of the value chain, which has to be uh, implemented in order for this to be a success. Uh, so, but we also want to be one part of the solution. And I manage the ports part of this, but we're several companies and the green bottom, I think. So uh, if we simple, simplify the value chain, we're in the middle, the handling infrastructure intermediates and also liquefaction parts uh, at a local um, place. And it will be open access. So uh, third party volumes will be able to come with train or trucks and local emission points will be able to add both gas and liquid pipelines. And the intersection is then from our key side out to the final storage. So what is Simfracap? It's a collaboration between the local energy company Göteborg Energi, us, the port, infrastructure owners Nordion Energy, Prim Refinery, Renova, the local waste incineration plant, SDS, which is also a refinery from the port. And this was the scope that if we come together, can we reduce the capex costs when we all are facing the problem of uh, invest in uh, liquefaction. Um, and we have come up with the studies that it's approximately 4 million tons uh, that we can ship out each year with today's uh, settings. So we work hard in order to increase that. And uh, the logistics is one of the, the flaskhalsar in Swedish, but the uh, bottlenecks. bottlenecks, thank you. Um, we got funding from the Swedish energy government and uh, indust called Industriklivet and one responsibility is then to share our knowledge. So we think that's very important. Even if we're small in the value chain, we still think that we could be hopefully a spark for this value chain. And now we invite new partners. So that's also a main message that we want to spread out for mainly Swedish 
companies that are planning and trying to find the logistics to transport their volumes out to final storage, then we're open to discussions. <coughs> So what was the, the ground scope? Uh, Preem, the refinery, started to talk to, um, uh, made a phone call to the infrastructure of natural gas owner, uh, Swedgas, which is now the company called Nordian Energy. Uh, they called us, do we have a piece of land for this? We need to find some kind of place to storage this before shipping it out. We said we should have more local partners. We invited the other refinery and also the waste incineration plant and of course emitting points of the energy company. <coughs> uh, so if we can only build one storage and one loading, we reduce the cost. That's our hope and scope. Uh, new partners, of course, because it's open access. If we start with the infrastructure that's on place, then the more volumes, it will reduce the cost for everyone. Uh, and of course, the local partners are shared liquidation with is possible. And we also believe uh, if we create this hub, we will have larger volumes and then hopefully will be a bargaining position towards the end storage uh, with that. And that's what we're in the discussion of finding the agreement forms, which is a very important part. So what's the status? In March, we finalized the feasibility study that is public online to, to uh, take uh, knowledge from. Now we are in the in-depth feasibility study, which we're already in the end of finalizing. We will report uh, a final uh, uh, report there as well that will be public. Uh, and then we have worked with technical solutions. That's not the problem. We have the site, we have, uh, we can expand. Um, one of the main thing has been the logistics. Uh, I will come to that later. Uh, we have worked with a business model concept. Uh, what we are now, the hypothesis, the scope is that the future infrastructure owners, Nordon Energy and Gothenburg Energy will create a joint venture and they will be the one investing in CAPEX costs and then also be responsible for the OPEX and running the plants. We as support will be the landlord and also our responsibility is to secure the infrastructure too and then also the key uh, capacity in order to have the vessels arrive. And users will be customers. And the, we have developed a tariff model which is based on open access. It's based on the LNG and natural gas uh, model, similar uh, with transparency, uh, volume based and cost reflective. The more volume that goes through, the less the cost of each tariff position. And a user only uses, only pays for what they use. A local actor that needs the pipeline the intermediate storage and then the queue, they pay for that. But for a third, for, um, an emitter in Sweden further north, they pay the transportation to the plant to another party and then we come in and they uh, will pay for the intermediate storage and transportation out. And of course take and play, uh, pay, which is similar to natural gas. And each, along with this project, all our partners of course have their own projects running, uh, the refineries need to look at their liquefaction. Are they going to do it together with us, the Simfracap, or then they're going to invest at their own house, so to say. Uh, and that has been and are one of the most challenging things. It's not the technique, it's there. It's having each partner's timeline and internal decision process matching for having the investment decision to add on to the right process. Uh, and now we're on the scope of developing the third phase. And uh, we as a harbor and also the, uh, uh, the uh, companies, uh, it needs to be based on commercial grounds, which is important. Of course, we apply for funding. We are looking into uh, applying for the innovation fund that we 
reduce the risk, but still we need to find a business case that we believe in and we believe in future volumes of CO2. And of course, uh, demand. <laughs> It needs to be a demand for our infrastructure and demand comes of the price. So the whole value chain has to be there uh, in order for our infrastructure to be a demand for. So it's important now that we want to be part of sharing knowledge and also learning a lot what uh, the customers is needing along the way. And I wrote incentives are important. That's a topic that a lot of, of, of the early discussions has been, but uh, it's the hen and the egg, uh, of course. So it's, uh, we shouldn't go deeper in that, but uh, of course for the whole value chain it's, it's important. Uh, you don't have to watch the details, but this is our preliminary timeline of the project that was uh, done before the Ukrainian crisis, uh, war. Uh, so, uh, now it's still the one that uh, we will update it until October, then it will become a new one, but we work for 2026. Um, we have learned something along the way, some lessons learned. Uh, one is definitely, as I mentioned before, uh, the commercial discussions should have started much earlier. It's so easy to come and talk about the technique, how should we solve this, what's the pipeline di dimension, what's the flow. Uh, we should have started the commercial discussions the same time as we started the uh, technical discussions. Uh, also, we uh, reduced the capital costs a lot uh, by choosing cylindrical vessels, prefabricated, compared to building them on site, cylindrical. So that's also one important lesson learned. And also there is a three years delivery time of the vessels, the cylindrical vessels, uh, which we hadn't calculated on. Um, so, yeah, so that's some of our lessons learned, but still it's 2026, more mi maybe in the beginning of 20 2027. And we want to be an infrastructure solution for early volumes in Sweden. Uh, and this is just, as I mentioned before, principles of the suggested tariff model that we have worked out, uh, as I mentioned before, open access, volume based and cost reflective and take or pay. Also, we put a lot of effort into the agreement and we have an, um, a hypothesis that we work for uh, with the, our uh, lawyers. And we are, the scope is four different categories. I mentioned the agreement of the one that creates the joint venture will be category one. Uh, the early movers along with Prem, which is the part that needs the, the uh, infrastructure first, will sign a different contract. And then other important stakeholders such as the energy company that don't have the need of the infrastructure to 2026, 20, seven but from 30 and on uh, they need to have to commit in a different way uh, when we are planning the volume of the intermediate storage of course and our phases of development and uh, we as a port uh, needs to also to be as uh, having the hat of landlords a separate agreement with the future owners of the infrastructure, because we as a port don't invest in the infrastructure. We're just landlords in this case. This is what we have come to the conclusion. Uh, so why do we want to do this as a hub, uh, as a port in Gothenburg? Well, uh, for many parts, but mainly because we have a very logistic, uh, good point of view on the West Coast. and. Um, I will click the text to come to the conclusion and, and back off a little bit. Uh, we see it as several parts. Um, as I mentioned before, if we create a hub with a lot of volumes, we believe that we will have a better bargaining positions toward storage. Um, and the discussion of who should own the CO2, the emitter who should write the agreements, is it with Symfrocap or with the final storage? Uh, we believe that uh, we could maybe have an umbrella uh, um, contract. Uh, 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 I don't find the English word of it, but that's, that's uh, one of the uh, things that we believe in. 
We also believe that uh, customers don't have to build larger storage facilities. If they have a faster, uh, more often uh, flow of, of uh, uh, shipping away their, their CO2 from the plants. Uh, when I say shipping, I mean, of course, by logistic on land. And here we say the rail port is very important in Sweden. We're very connected with that. Uh, and also, in the beginning, we believe that the capacity of the ships on the market might not be that much as the demand. And how will the fleet owners, um, when they are going to put the price on sending a ship to pick up volumes, how will they put the price on a ship that needs to go empty uh, more, one and a half more days, uh, fill it approximately nine to 12 hours, then go back. It's around three and a half days extra leg compared to going to a big, large hub that they can directly fill it and then go back. So that's our thesis that we will leave in. Um, so that was the project, Sinfracap, and I just want to round up with some uh, uh, points of view from a, a harbor. <laughs> and uh, uh, the world's most competitive port. Yes, we're small, but we're still Scandinavian's largest port. And through Gothenburg, 40% uh, of the uh, liquid fuels that are used in Sweden pass us, and a lot of value change goes through us. Even if we're a small part, we're still part of a lot of value change. Uh, and we have a clear mission, vision, values, but I want to come to these for us. We're municipality owned, but 100% own finance. So we need to run our port uh, business. So the business cases that we take out, we need to believe in. And we see some uh, key uh, factors, which is nothing new to a lot of you companies, but of course, digitalization. We need to have a growth in order for our calculations to uh, uh, add on, and also we see it as a good business in investing in environmental parts, of course. And uh, you see the goal 70 reduction of CO2 emissions by end 2030. The Gothenburg city have signed to be a climate neutral. Why just 70 percent? That is because we have said we take responsibility for. Um, she just said round up <laughs> one minute uh, for a radius both on the seaside and the land side, the Gothenburg municipality and the seaside. And seaside is connected internationally. Uh, so we need to work with the international value change and therefore make sure that the infrastructure that they need is there. So we are striving to become a green hub of uh, uh, the northern countries, of the new fuels that are needed. And uh, one person either mentioned the power need. Uh, and we just want to share that this is nothing new for us, uh, or this is nothing um, unique about the port. All of us that are needs more energy in some way can be connected to ele electricity need. Uh, but what we see is the most challenging is what happens in the near future be a challenge. And we uh, believe as a neutral part, we could be a change maker in providing a test area for a lot of customers and companies. Uh, so as Scandinavia's largest port, we have a responsibility to build the infrastructure that Sweden needs and also international to change the seaside and vessel side and aircraft as well. Uh, so, and this is just a uh, selection of initiatives that we have. So we see CO2 as a natural mix in our future portfolio when the fossil fuels are being reduced, but also along with other uh, like hydrogen, methanol, ammonia and electrical charging as well for ships. So yeah, thank you for inviting us. That was just some views from a port side of the value chain. Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Marlin, from the perspective from the port of Gothenburg. Since we are a bit short on time, I would ask everybody to keep their questions in mind and we go to the next session immediately. I think there will be possibility to ask the questions later. Now we have a very interesting panel discussion coming up. And for that, I would like to introduce our discussion moderator, Mr. Gauter Hagerup from Innovation Nor Norway, 
who has also formerly worked for the C40 Cities Networks. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, and let's get the panel the participants up. Uh, Stina from uh, Gothenburg. Tina, yes. Nice. Tina, sorry. Uh, Janneke from uh, from uh, Hofslund, Celsius. Per from uh, Heidelberg. And uh, let me see, you were for also Connie, yes, from Stora Enso. And Einar from the city of Oslo, as well as René from the city of Zurich. Welcome. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say, you know, Einar, I think you uh, have become a very cool influencer. I mean, you should insta Instagram yourself with uh, the new outfit, <laughs> business suit and biker shoes. I mean, that's the, the new fashion for 2022, I think. I'll go for that. And um, yes, great, great panel up here. Um, I'd deep dive into this topic directly by asking you, Einar, you just um, explained to us the amazing tool that Oslo has developed for uh, steering on their climate goals, which is the climate budget. <coughs> I just have to say that there are now 14 of the largest cities in the world through the C40 network, which are now learning from Oslo and building their own climate budgets, implementing it. So this is really <coughs> spreading its way throughout the world. But the question, Einar, how uh, do you uh, engage business and industry in Oslo to take part in those ambitions? Mm. First, I would like to say, and that is very important, we are also learning from them because this has now become... Uh, what is it called? What is the English word? It's a big duke, no? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, a big, it's, it's a big shared effort uh, uh, developing uh, climate budgeting as a, as a policy tool. And it's being adapted in small municipalities uh, and in mega cities. So, uh, so we, are, we are learning a lot. Well, in engaging <coughs> the business community, um, from the perspective of the municipality, we do that in several ways. I engage through uh, being responsible for the procurement policy of the city of Oslo. Uh, we have a very strict climate measures in our procurement policy. So, uh, for instance, um, uh, when, I, when, I became, um, when I became a wise mayor, I changed the uh, procurement policy or the, or the standards for, for uh, emissions from transport. So if you want to have a deal now, with uh, a big deal uh, with the Oslo municipality, you need to, to have zero emissions in the transport of the service or the goods we are procuring. For instance, first first deal we had was with the new regime was uh, actually locksmiths because uh, <laughs> we have lots and lots of schools and kindergartens and, 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 and buildings and there are lots of doors that, that has to be fixed all the time. And we made a new deal with locksmiths uh, and one of the demands is that that locksmith, when he travels to a school to fix the door, he has to travel with zero emissions. So he has to have an electric van. And if you have a diesel van, he won't get a deal with the municipality. And, uh, and, and that way we are engaging. Um, and we are doing that on many, many levels. Um, and it works two ways. First, it sort of reduces the emissions from, from sort of our activities. But it also changes the, uh, the market because uh, we immediately saw a huge demand for electric vans. So uh, uh, if, because everyone who, who thinks that maybe my company in the future would like to have a deal with the municipality, even if you don't have a uh, deal now, they, they have to procure uh, electric vehicles or zero emission vehicles in order to, to, uh, to have that deal. Um, also, <coughs> um, the, the other uh, mayors, especially the mayor for, for transport and environment and the mayor for, uh, for business, um, have developed uh, a network with, uh, with uh, a lot of businesses, those who want to go ahead. And that is very, very important for us because in, in this network we can discuss for instance, uh, we are now saying that if you want to build something, if, when Oslo is building something, like a new school, we want to build it with zero emissions. Uh, and, and when we have, want to new, uh, and that means we need electric excavators and electric lorries, and, uh, or, or maybe on hydrogen. Um, and in order to make sure that we can do that, we have to engage with the business community and say, can you, do, can you supply? And, what kind of, and, and if you can't supply, what, what, what should we do in order to 
get to a point where you actually can supply this service? How should we, can we do something with our tenders in order to promote? If, if, if we can't say, because some, sometimes we say that we demand it in our tender, sometimes we say that we give it extra points in the competition, uh, and so on. And that is very, very useful, and often the business community is coming back to us and saying, yeah, you're too slow, you should be stricter, because uh, technology is changing so fast and we are changing so fast. So, so, uh, so that is very, very useful. Thanks. Yes, we are now discussing, you know, pathways towards climate neutral cities. And it is a fact, I think, that cities all around the world seem to be more progressive, more ambitious than the national governments. I think that's a general trend that we, that we see. Uh, we also had a very interesting discussion here earlier before the coffee break about, you know, making these uh, climate neutral projects uh, 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 commercially viable. There needs to be a commercial aspect of it. And I'd like to ask Per and Connie, representing private sector here, uh, how do you see the city's um, uh, in initiatives uh, affect the, the, the actual markets being built up? I think you have uh, some good points here from the community, etc. Because I think you have to look for low carbon products. And as I said earlier, we have a problem if there is not a market. If you have one cement producer in the world producing cement or CCS cement, then it's a difficult to make a market. But you can say the, the requirements to have a deal is that you have a low carbon footprint, as low as possible, and then you give an extra point to those which are close to zero. That's, that's one point I think is re really important. Where the, the industry and the... the, the building material producers can can uh, contribute to, to do so. Then I would say, another side, as, as, uh, as uh, Yannick is talking about, I think it's a fantastic way to work, to, to do something with the waste incinerator and to use the energy and to, 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 keep, to capture the, the, the CO2 from this waste production. Because you have to treat the waste in a good way, and it's much better to burn it and to use the energy and then to capture it. Then the old ways to do it. But for, for the industry, it's about the, the carbon footprint. Mm. What about you, Connie, on the same question? Uh, as Per finished, the carbon footprint is crucial, both to our industry and all to, to our customers. And we, we would very much like to supply the next school to Oslo from the, the, uh, our sawmill in Ingrums, in Värmland where we make cross-laminated timber. So cities shouldn't be allowed to use non-CCS cement in buildings. <laughs> they should only build wooden houses. And we, we, yeah, we can make 10, 15, 20 stories buildings also. But we need a CCS cement for the foundation and the tower for the ele elevator. But otherwise, it's wood. <laughs> Great. Janneke first and then René. Uh, and there would be some recycle. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and there would be some recycled concrete that you could use as well for, yeah. for it, uh, uh, where we included the, the CO2 captured from, from an installation as well. So that really, in the procurement processes, cities have power and can uh, give incentives to, to the industries. And in our case, it was the concrete recycling without the city procurement, he never would have been successful city in Zurich uh, constructs more than uh, for half a billion every year. Thank you. I would like to uh, underline that I, me too, uh, I, I, not me too, but uh, <laughs> I as well represent the commercial uh, side. Uh, we actually have two uh, venture funds as owners now. Um, and it's interesting to see why are they investing in, uh, in this business. Obviously, they're interested in, in the whole company, but they're also investing heavily in the CCS project, the CCS plant. And why is that? Because they see a future prospect of being a front runner, using the opportunity to, to gain knowledge and, and share the learning and also build on that competence to, uh, to increase the, the business in, within CCS. And also because they believe that 
dealing with the CO2 emissions from this end of line solution for residual waste will be a future license to operate for these plants. So it's a necessary means that we all need to calculate into our future plans. So it's also an investor thing to, to, to work on this. Exactly. Yes, yes. But then, uh, then Zürich and Oslo, uh, do you feel you have sufficient freedom from your national governments to be as strict in your procurement process, to set the criteria as you like, as, uh, to build up these markets? We have uh, the same structure as in, in Norway, I think the three level. I think in Oslo you have the advantage that you are a city and a county. This we would like as well, <laughs> but we don't have it. So we have a, a national government, then we have the canton, and then the city. And uh, yeah, we would, la we would love that the canton and the national government would support in several topics as much more but that's always uh, uh, on and off and sometimes uh, it's in front uh, the canton and we are behind but of course it's uh, it's a deal with uh, the levels that they go ahead as well with us that they support for example with the energy law just first of september the canton of zurich introduced a new energy law um, uh, from nowadays, uh, there is no fossil fuel heating anymore allowed in the canton of Zurich. But in other cantons, still. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so the national government uh, don't have that. In Basel, it was five years ago. Basel is a county and a city. So they are faster. They are always five years faster than Zurich <laughs> because they, they can do both. Yeah. Um. So if you are jealous uh, at Oslo, which is a county and, a, and, a, and a, a municipality at the same time, I'm jealous of Hamburg, which is a city-state uh, <laughs> and, 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 and has even more possibilities. Actually, in the, in the field of procurement, I think we often, more often run into EU regulations rather than national regulations. That is probably because they are the same. Um, one thing that helped a lot was that we were able to change the guidelines for... Um, if, if you have a tender process, uh, you are sort of in a competition, you are awarding the points for, and, and somebody wins, and you are awarding points for being the most cost effective, highest quality, and, and, and environmental issues. And we were uh, able to, to, uh, to give, to, to increase how much weight you could put onto environmental issues and increase that up to 30%. So that was a national regulation. That helped a lot because that means we can let the most uh, environmental friendly provider win the competition, even if he's much more expensive uh, or ha has perhaps a lower, slightly lower quality. So, so that helps uh, because in markets that are very immature, you, you have to somehow uh, give, give, give those who are the forerunners an advantage. And then uh, doing it that way is, is a good thing. We've seen the same thing, actually. In a, we also use our procurement policy to, uh, to, to secure uh, um, a, a bet, uh, what is the English word? Uh, to secure better working conditions for those who work on contracts for, for Oslo municipality. And there we have seen the same thing. We, are, we, are, we want to have stricter regulations than the, than the and we run, in, we run into trouble with the, uh, or there is a boundary set by the by the European Union regulations. Mm -hmm. um, especially, I'll break you off there and uh, give the word over to Janneke. I also wanted to uh, emphasize that um, being a representative for the commercial part of the of the waste handling, cities or municipalities can also do the same thing with procurement of waste services, uh, because there are we are mainly treating waste from uh, municipalities surrounding Oslo. So we're basically bidding in the market and it's fully possible for these municipalities and for uh, industrial waste possessors to actually demand more climate friendly waste services to ask for uh, uh, CO2 neutral waste services in the market. So this is exactly the same mechanism that we can see also on waste services. Can I also ask you, Janneke, when we talk about this collaboration between uh, company, city and state, I know that there was a process in, in, uh, in your project that was a bit delayed. You had political commitment to do this, then there was, uh, you needed some extra time to find the funding and so on. Can you 
tell us a little bit about how this collaboration between company, city, state, how was that? Uh, yes, um, so as you mentioned, we, uh, as part of the Longship value chain, our project did not, did not receive full funding in 2020 with the realization of Longship, but we did receive funding. Uh, 3 billion NOC, or about 300 million euros, from the Norwegian state, in addition to the transport and storage services for 10 years. So we needed to find the remaining funding for the project. And we managed to do that uh, uh, together with the city of Oslo and also with our new owners that uh, took over the company this spring. So this was a joint effort where all parties basically realized that we need to chip in to make this uh, possible. For the city, it was an obvious advantage with uh, uh, reducing this large point source of emission, uh, making it possible to reach the climate goals. For the owners, as I mentioned, in addition to the, the company, the district heating side of the company, it's also uh, an important new area to build competence and, uh, and knowledge, and then as a future license to operate. So this was a joint effort, and I think we, we, we need to see more of that in the future to lift these first projects before we have uh, the natural cost uh, savings from actually dealing with the CO2 emissions. I see Per wants to say a comment as well. And then afterwards, I'd like to invite Gothenburg into the mix here. But I, uh, first. I fully agree with you. about, And that's about the uh, purchasing power. You have it and other, it's, uh, it's important. Sometimes you have to really help and I think that was the thinking behind the long ship, that you help the first, the, the front movers, etc. that can do this. And that's so important. But it must be, as you said, you have the possibility within the rules today to give extra weight to the environmental, the innovation, etc. On, on, uh, and not uh, accept that, okay, the price might be a little bit higher. And I think that is important, important to do so. And Tina, looking at Gothenburg, I mean, uh, the same topic to you now. Who, who is pushing, who is, pull, who is dragging behind, who is driving this uh, excellent project that you were, uh, you were demonstrating here? I mean, you are <coughs> not maybe rep representing the city, but you are an entity in the city. So yeah, a collaboration, yes. Is it the yes. private sector that drives it? Is it the city? Is it you as a project manager? Exactly. No, very good it? question. Um, each ports are, have different responsibilities and setups. For our case in Gothenburg, uh, we ha can drive it as a <laughs> private company. And I think that's when you talk about innovation and new ideas and striving to change systems. I think that's a pro. Uh, so definitely in the Gothenburg case, it's the companies along with Gothenburg Energy. So that is definitely pushing this. Um, uh, refineries are not uh, green CO2, of course, but they're, that's a very important factor for them in order to survive. Um, along with also uh, the energy company and the waste incineration have their own agenda on why CCS is important. So, um, you know, it's a collaboration. I think that's at least for our part, uh, when we summarize, uh, nobody knows what the future needs. Our responsibility as support is to supply the infrastructure that the industry needs, that Sweden needs for the transition. And that's why we need to have good collaborations with a lot of value chains. And uh, just uh, um, send, I think, a lot of ports out there in the world it needs to uh, be part of good collaborations because they could have a the neutral ground of being a test area of new infrastructure that is a part of the value chain between land transport and ocean transport and as such a player really. Yes, and, and in Gothenburg's case, if we talk about the, the emissions, it's an um, emission hub because we have the refineries, we have a lot of industries such as Volvo, North Fault Future Batteries, uh, and also a big energy district. Uh, so uh, to, if you find the single points, find the collaboration of creating a hub, hopefully share the infrastructure costs, and then make it open access. It could be an ignition for larger flows in the society, and that's what we want to be part of. Thanks, Janneke. And then after that, I have one question that I would like everyone to answer before we end up. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, what they're doing in, in Gothenburg is uh, 
I think it's really important to actually establish this hub. We see that we have uh, challenges with this uh, in Port of Oslo. Uh, they have uh, a lot of pressure on their areas and it's hard to find the location for this uh, CO2 hub. So I'd say great thinking and it's a really important uh, infrastructure to establish. I agree, I fully agree. I'm sorry, I forgot to use my mic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just one interesting fact that I would like to share with you before I ask that final question. Uh, you know that uh, the slide shown by uh, Hendrik from Fraunhofer that the urbanization in the world is, is really picking up at, at speed. Uh, we are building globally now so many new buildings in the cities of the world that it, it equals to one city of Stockholm every week. It equals one city of New York every month. And that's going on for the un until the unforeseeable future which is exactly why we need initiatives like Heidelberg Cement. And you have an infinite market if we can find a way to scale this up. Um, so that is the introduction to my last question, which I would like everyone to ask, answer from their specific point of views. Companies answer it from their point of view, the cities from their point of view. What do you wish, what, what do you want to do, what do you want to see happen to make this scale up? either as a politician or as a company manager. You can start down by, by you, Per. We, we need to be quick because we only have five minutes left. I hope that, uh, I really foresee that, uh, that coming more cement plants, cement companies going for CCS, that we have a market and that the procurement processes give a lot of weight to the CCS cement and CCS concrete, which they need. Thank you. People are moving to cities and this is where we need to solve the, a lot of the climate issues. So for uh, my sector, uh, we need to accelerate the transition from landfills and methane emissions to sustainable waste solutions with sorting, recycling and waste to energy. And for these projects, it's important to have the framework for uh, carbon removals in place because this will be an important revenue stream for these next projects to come. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I, I was just going to say the same. Uh, uh, from our point of view, it's not the technique that is the issue, it's the commercial discussions and the legal frames that need to be on place. So, and also for us to be a, a big hub, we need to look at the infrastructure nationally so it doesn't be sub-optimized. And there, train is a very important, so we have our public... Uh, Affairs uh, uh, department, of course, has discussions with uh, the national train company as well. So a push for goods traffic in Sweden, I would like to see. Put money on that, politicians. For me, f what I would wish for the future, to, what I see that we need is, I think we, we need these uh, courageous leaderships. Um, so these this good examples, lighthouses like we have here in, in Oslo, several pro projects uh, like the city initiatives. And then I think we, we need as well a, a very strong cooperation. It's not uh, one city, one country that can uh, tackle this climate change. It's all of us uh, and we need this really strong cooperation between the cities, with the countries, uh, with public-private uh, partnerships. Um, only with that courageous leadership and strong cooperation. Uh, uh, of course, we want more wooden buildings, but <laughs> we also see that as we are, uh, have only on, almost purely biogenic emissions, we see that negative emissions by bioCCS should be realized at large scale. Every slide shows that needs gigaton scale and the commercial and viable long-term adaption of that. We don't build equipment for five years, 10 years. We will for 30, 40, 50 year operation. The mill where we are doing our piloting, it has a, it's only 125 years old. The company as such is 734 years old. So, we build for a long-term future and the long-term reliable 
commercial solution for this is important. Is it on? Yes, it is. Um, the cities have uh, the, the cities have a huge room of possibilities with the, for using policy, and there are some boundaries. I think in in this issue, uh, what I really want is that for the government to give us some more regulatory tools. For instance, we want to regulate emission intensity of building materials in the planning process. Then we can say prospect future builders that yes, you can you can build that area. What you have to do it with zero carbon uh, uh, concrete or with wood. That is not allowed now. So we need new tools. And then we, I think we need a huge coalition uh, of, of uh, uh, business and, uh, and, uh, and uh, municipalities and cities going ahead saying, yes, we are going to do everything we can to, to buy those products and, and use those products in order to secure a market, uh, market for them. And you need to <laughs> supply the, the goods. Um, and that coalition needs to be bigger than it is today because we in, in Norway, we are ahead of the other municipalities and ahead of the government. But we are not big enough. Even though we have a big budget, we are small in, in, in this sense. So we need, we need many more on the, on the team saying the same things, securing the market for, for zero emission concrete or, 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 or other kinds of zero emission building materials, even if they are slightly more expensive than uh, old products. Wow, fantastic. We finished exactly on time. Impressive. Uh, I'd like to say thank you very much for an interesting discussion, a great panel. And uh, these topics that we've discussed here are so important and so interesting. I'm sure we will discuss it further also after this in the days and years to come as well. Uh, thanks a lot and give the panel a big hand.
Um, and just want to. Just said beforehand, both live and online, with their, to the email, and we will also put the recording directly on the website of the Access Project. So, because the Access Project that has been organizing this, that's what I'm going to talk to you about now, uh, as a short introduction before we give the floor to other presentations, and about how European funding can pave the way for cl climate neutrality or contribute to this climate neutrality that we need to reach. We haven't seen this graph, even if we have talked about it today. Uh, in Access, we have a vision, and that's for a reason, that we want to develop replicable CCUS pathways towards a climate neutral Europe in 2050. Uh, we know that it's not enough just to cut CO2 emissions, uh, emit less. We also need to start removing. This graph is a couple of years old from the IPCC. There, uh, even in one of the more dramatic uh, scenarios, you can see that emissions started going down in 2020, and then it needed to go very steeply down after around 2030. It hasn't gone down really after 2020, and we're soon in 2023. So we're in for an even steeper ride if we're going to reach the climate neutrality in 2050. And we have industrial sectors in access that can contribute to this carbon dioxide removal. I think you've heard and understood about this already. But the extent of the contribution, of course, depends on the feedstock of these um, industries and the characteristics of each sector. And a very sort of basic uh, view may be unnecessary for this public, but what we are talking about is that for a couple of hundred years, in an accelerating speed since the Industrial Revolution, we have used fossil fuels and limestone from the ground in the industrial processes, and we have emitted CO2 to the atmosphere. That has helped us build the society we have today. That's just the way it is. But the good news now, these days, is that for these industries, we can capture and store the CO2. We have the technology, we have the first, the first plants are on the way, and we can use this to also remove CO2 from the atmosphere if we use biomass. Uh, we have, as you said, Connie, you have billions of uh, entities that capture CO2 every day, and they, you call them trees. If we, to a certain extent, use these trees within reasonable, sustainable limits in our industrial processes, we can actually capture and permanently remove CO2 from the, atmospheric, uh, uh, from the atmosphere and the biosphere. And that is what Access is about. We call ourselves a climate-positive project. We have four industrial sectors that we investigate. Uh, it's pulp and paper, waste to energy and cement. You have met them here today. And we're also doing but a more limited study on biorefineries to produce biofuels. Even if you produce biofuels, you also release some CO2. If you capture that also, that's also uh, biogenic CO2 capture. And depending on the refinery, if it's retrofitted or not, it dep uh, depends on how much would be the fossil and the biogenic CO2. So CDR, carbon dioxide removal, is one of the new three-letter abbreviations we need to learn. Uh, pulp and paper, if we kept in 90%, we can have 90% carbon dioxide removal. Waste of energy, about 50%. Cement, depending on the fuel, you know that two-thirds come from the limestone of the CO2. If you uh, add some bio biomass, perhaps we can remove perhaps 30% of the CO2 that we remove is carbon uh, biogenic. And this is one of the ideas behind the Access Project. This is like the one page I show you. I'm just going to tell... A little bit about access, this is what I usually show. It's about providing access to cost-efficient, replicable, safe and flexible CCUS. Uh, we're uh, what's called a, an innovation action funded by the European Union. Uh, we started May last year and go on until April 2025, so it's a four-year project. We're coordinating it from Sintef Energy. I have the privilege to actually coordinate this project together with an amazing consortium. And we have a budget of 18 0.4 million euro, 15 million come from the European Union. Without the European Union and the, their funding for research and innovation, this project would not exist, that's for sure. We have three main parts, three main objectives in this project. It's about CO2 capture, and also a little bit about the use that René talked about, actually. So demonstrate CO2 capture and also use in industry. We're going to have a demonstrator of the recarbonation 
of demolition concrete in the project. It hasn't started yet, it starts next year. But it's exactly what you talked about, that we use demolition concrete, we add CO2, we have a new filling material in concrete. We also, in addition to the piloting of CO2 capture, we also uh, have several studies at full scale on how can we en integrate CO2 capture in the most pos energy efficient way possible because it takes energy to capture CO2. We need to use that energy in the best possible way, that whatever we have available. But it's also about the chains. It's not only enough about capture. We need to take the captured CO2, transport it, perhaps via a hub like in Sinfracap uh, or other ways, and to a storage site. And we have a lot of work in this project about how, we develop, how can we develop the chains for CCS, CCUS, from both from continental and Europe and from the Baltic area and take the CO2 to, to uh, the North Sea and store it there. You will hear more about that in a later presentation. And the th last and third part is about the society, the cities and the stake the, all the stakeholders that need to be involved, informed, engaged in this. And we need to explain the societal benefits that CCS brings uh, when it brings when you have both uh, capturing CO2 and storing it, uh, using it in products for permanent storage. And we have a particular focus on sustainable city development in this project. Uh, a little bit. You will hear more about the CO2 capture pilot from Sergio. I, I want to talk more about the European aspect here. It shows the road towards uh, demonstrating uh, a SIPEM CO2, solution, CO2 solutions technology uh, at, uh, in the operational environment. We, we're using the pilot rig at FOTUM. Sorry, Celsius. I'm sorry about the blooper, Janneke. It should say Celsius. But it says Celsius in the picture. <laughs> uh, and we, we have a rotary packed bed, a unit that we believe can save space and uh, hopefully also cost, that is being developed now in Poland that will be shipped together with the uh, rig from Celsius to Technology Center Mongsta and put an operation together. The European journey continues to Storenzo in Sweden and then to Gorazda in Poland. So we have a European collaboration here with Italian, Bel Italian Norwegian, uh, Swedish and Polish uh, technology here. Uh, this is a quick view of the consortium. You see the map of uh, the blue countries are the different countries that are in the project, eight different countries. And uh, not to read the, the long list on the side, this is the members of the consortium, 18 members and four of their affiliates are also involved here. And we have the large industry actors like Storens, Heidelberg Cement and Hafslund, technology suppliers, we have Equinor and Total, uh, we, and we have several research partners here also. We've heard from Fraunhofer, we've heard from ETH and Chalmers. And uh, in the end, I also want to acknowledge again the European funding that makes this project possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have time for a short question perhaps, or otherwise I will give the floor to the next speaker. Any questions? No, then I would like to give the floor to Sergio Armenante from Saipan to tell us about their CO2 capture technology. Uh, good afternoon. So first of all, thank you for inviting us in this very important uh, venue and event. It is a pleasure for, uh, for us being part of this uh, very important project which is focusing on uh, the carbon capture. And as a Saipan, Saipan is a uh, an oil and gas service provider, basically, but we have a, a strong accent on technological uh, uh, innovation. And so we are uh, trying to help our client and the institution in, uh, towards the, the net zero goal and uh, helping in reducing the greenhouse uh, emission. So uh, today here, I'm representing Saipem, I'm the head of uh, technological uh, development. But basically, we are here today because we want to drive you through the, the story of uh, our, I mean, the, the technology that we are applying in the, in the pilot plant of uh, uh, Celsius facility that will then move uh, in other facilities to demonstrate in several hard to abate industry the ability of this technology to capture the CO2. Okay. 
So, first of all, a little bit of background about the carbon capture technology. It is plenty of uh, technology, okay? So, normally these are efficient, are proven, because, uh, by the way, the, the industry has been uh, capturing CO2 since long, long time for different uh, uh, needs. And the same technology used for, uh, I mean, pre-combustion have been applied in, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this industry right now are efficient because they can also capture a, a large quantity of the CO2 entering a, an unit and has a very important uh, purity at the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the stream that is exiting the, uh, the plant. However, there are the, the dark side. I mean, here is in red, but... So, it's a conundrum, but uh, to capture CO2, you need CO2 to be... if you are not using green energy. So, uh, in a way or another, we need to find the processes which are uh, using, uh, which are efficient, using uh, less CO2 to capture the CO2. In most of the cases, we are using chemicals. We, we can, can be, that are of course not to, uh, needs to be handled with, with care. Uh, you need to, uh, to handle the, the waste coming out from the units and you need to select properly the materials, as well uh, use uh, uh, other technology to purify the stream entering the, the capture unit. Okay, this is normal, normal uh, stuff for uh, carbon capture technologies. So our technology try to overcome some of these uh, uh, hurdles. Of course, it's not perfect like all the others, but uh, has some advantages in respect of the others. So, and what is for me more important about this, without making so much of advertising, is just really talking technically. Our technology is a bit more efficient than the traditional one, and it's a bit sustainable because it is using an enzymatic solution, an enzyme to uh, catalyze the, the, the reaction of, uh, of absorption. And this is the basic principle. So, who invented this technology, which has been developed in Canada some time ago, was uh, elaborating on the principle that uh, in our body we are, we are, I mean, we are breathing to, to survive and we are absorbing uh, the CO2 and there is an equilibrium inside our body that is uh, regulated by this uh, enzyme called the carbonic anhydrase, CA. So, the same enzyme has been with several modifications, used in a, in a solution of uh, uh, potassium carbonate to absorb the, the, the CO2, okay? And the, the specific uh, um, activity, the, two, the, 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 the goal of using uh, this enzyme is because the enzyme is uh, doing the, the, the catalysis of this absorption. So, by uh, adding this to the normal uh, uh, solution, you will have uh, a much more efficient process of absorption. But this is uh, the, the main benefit, because this is, uh, again, something that uh, it is less uh, toxic than, uh, for instance, an, an amine-based uh, solution. And this is the main feature. And also requi requires less energy than uh, a traditional uh, CO2 uh, capture based on, uh, on, uh, on a mine. So without going too much into the technical detail here, because probably I will bother you, but uh, I mean, this is the, the process. It's a very simple process for, uh, for, the, for a chemical engineer, but in which you have a, a section in which you have a, a cooling tower which is uh, cooling, of course, and then removing some of the contaminants. Then you have uh, an absorption tower, which is the, the main item of this uh, unit, in which you have the, the contact between the vapor, the vapor phase, the, the CO2 to be captured, and uh, the, the lean solvent. And then you have a regeneration uh, section in which the, the CO2 is stripped, and uh, this is actually the, 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 the stream that is going to the to the utilization, I mean, to whatever is the use. So what is the advantage that of our technology? Is that uh, in, uh, in our uh, technology, we are able to regenerate the, the solution 
with a lower temperature. Normally in the mine based basin process you reach above 100, 110, 120 degrees. Here we are able to stay at the lower temperature. And so this has a, an implicit advantage in terms of uh, energy used. Okay, but the, the energy used, the, it is in any case used here in the compressor anyway, in the pumps and in other users, which are a must. <laughs> you cannot, we, we cannot go away with, from this. And the, the other point is that all these processes are, are treating a, a low pressure stream, which is increasing the volume of the, the volumetric flow of the stream, and then you need bigger equipment to make it simple. So, this slide is summarizing the advantage of our technology. Probably, I, I mean, I, the, the main thing that uh, the, the takeaway for, 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 uh, for our, for, from this slide is that it is using a proprietary solvent based on the, en on, on the enzyme, but is not using any proprietary item. So it's something simple, can use also low cost material. And uh, uh, we can say that in a way or another, uh, it is competitive in respect of, to the unmined solution because we don't have uh, any toxic uh, solvent. Okay, so this is a bit of background of our uh, technology development. No? So we went through all the steps of developing a new technology. And uh, we, are, we are arrived at the point in which, uh, in a uh, few years ago, we have built a pylon, uh, industrial pilot plant of a capacity of 30 tons per day, which is not small. I mean, it's uh, significant in, uh, in um, Canada, in San Felicien. And uh, this is a very peculiar uh, location because it is uh, capturing the, the CO2 generated by a pulp mill, and then uh, it is delivering the captured, captured CO2 to a greenhouse. So there is a, a network, there is a connection there, which is very much important, a key element in, in all these uh, initiatives. And so then, uh, uh, we, we, the plant is operating, is running, we, we demonstrated the, the performances, we are doing uh, now a further step in developing the technology, which is mainly consisting in involving the partners like Novozyme to improve the, uh, the enzyme and the, and the performance of the, of the solvent itself. And then we are ready to, let's say, commercialize the solution to, to do the next step, no? Because still we don't have a, a commercial application yet in, in, our, in our portfolio, but we, are, we have several initiatives that we are following up and we hope that some of these will, uh, will come uh, <coughs> real in the, in the next days. So now we come to the pilot that we have in the, in the Celsius um, facilities. So you see here, uh, you have a, a sort of a, uh, representation of the, the pilot in which you see the two big column there. This pilot has the, the advantage that, believe it or not, it is a uh, transportable, so it will be dismantled and then uh, relocated in another uh, location. So um, in the, the test uh, was started during this summer period and uh, we operated uh, for in, in, this, uh, in this month and we are satisfied because we demonstrated the, 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 the performance, so we were able to achieve what, what was, was the expected performances with a flue gas co concentration of about 12%. You see here some picture of the facility, but you, I mean, if you have the chance to, to come with us uh, later on, you, you, you will have also the possibility to, to see it. But what is uh, new for, uh, about this technology, okay, this is the result, just to show you that uh, we achieved the, the efficiency that we were targeting, so it is 92%, which is a good result, and also the, the capacity of the plant is more or less what we were looking at. But what we are now looking is the next step. Okay, so this is really the one of the, the, the main point of this access project for us. That is the application of what it is written here, RPB, that was introduced by uh, Christine before. So the RPB stands for rota rota uh, Rotating Packing Bed. 
It is practically a sort of centrifugal equipment in which the contact between the vapor phase and the liquid phase it is uh, happening through this uh, bed which is rotating. So the, me the mechanism of uh, the absorption is not going through the normal uh, gravity flow, but it is using the exploiting the uh, the centrifugal force. Okay, so this is uh, a design by Prospin, who is a, a uh, Polish uh, process designer of special item with, with whom we are collaborating. We, we have a very good relationship and we are trying to develop with them this technology. What is the advantage of the technology? It's practically that by applying, you see in the picture here, two of these uh, centrifuges, we are removing one column there, the big column. Big saving in terms of space, in terms of cost, transportability, and so on. So this is the the the, the, the real stage. So now this has been tested in in a bench in a lab in a bench lab, very positive result. The the items that uh, are going to be installed in the uh, in the next step are under fabrication, almost uh, close to completion, and then uh, they will be delivered and installed on a slipstream or in a parallel stream to replace the absorb. Okay, so what we expect is that uh, they, they will confirm the, all the, the positive uh, outcome of the lab uh, result. And so then we can say that we can replace the column with the, this, uh, these items. You see here that there are uh, some uh, information about the, the next step of this uh, uh, test campaign, which is going to the next step is uh, TCM in uh, Mongstad with a flu concentration of CO2, which is very much variable. So we'll try to cope also with this. We have the, the next uh, step. It is the paper mill plant in Sweden with a different CO2 concentration. And then uh, uh, finally, the, the test in the cement plant in Poland. Okay, this, this, the same steps are represented here in this uh, picture, which is anyway replacing the one with the big, uh, big arrow. <laughs> so at the end of this, the aim of the, this uh, project is to reach uh, what, the, what we call TRL at the level of seven. So technological risk uh, level of seven, which means that the joint application of the RPB and our technology can be seven. Instead, our technology alone is at level eight. So we are missing only the last step for the industrial application. And with this is pretty much all. And I hope that you will enjoy the visit in, uh, in the Celsius facility to, to see the, the pilot. Thank you very much, Sergio. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, Kristin. The mic. Thank you, uh, Kristin Unaheim, Arke Carbon Capture. Thank you very much uh, for the interesting presentation and for pushing forward new technology. Uh, you compared quite a lot with amine technology. Mm. Can you say something about or give some indication about the improvement in efficiency and also compared to the traditional HPC? Okay, so um, we, we have some evaluation uh, ongoing. We are doing a, what we call a life cycle assessment that we, it is ready, done by a third party. Uh, for which I mean I, I cannot disclose all the information, which but it will made it will be for sure made public. But I can say that there will be a, a there is an improvement in the range between the ten and fifteen percent. This is what we we expect. Then really depends on the way in which you do the the comparison because the there are uh, I mean we we're saying listening before in terms of energy you have several possibility. You, you can use uh, energy from the existing, the hosting plant, for instance, if you have, uh, so the reboiler can be replaced by 
a waste it recovery system or whatever. I mean, instead, what you cannot, we cannot replace is the compressor. The main, the main user of this unit is the, the, the compressor, which is taking the, uh, the CO2, the captured CO2 from a very low pressure to the, the pressure that you have to deliver. And this is practically similar for both uh, technology, to be, to be honest. And uh, the, real, the real point for us is the, the low temperature in the, in the red boiler. This is the, the, main, the main element. Okay, thank you, Sergio. I think we need to move on to the next speaker, but we will have some time really in the end also for questions and answers. Thank you very much. Then we have come to, yeah, we can give you a hand also. <laughs> We have come to the next speaker, which is Professor Philip Johnson, who will tell us more about uh, the product value chains, the, uh, and the cost of climate neutrality. So, Yes, thank you very much. So uh, I guess I say like Monty Python now to something completely different. So it's more on, a, on overall uh, cost, what this will cost us to do this, of course, to... Um, the also general link to the whole cost of, uh, of fixing climate. So uh, uh, I will discuss a little bit of, of, of product chains, uh, value chain and, and supply chains. So I don't know, doesn't, next, doesn't work. Mm. Ah. So I'll, I'll tell you about two things. First, uh, as an example, then uh, in this audience, the. Uh, Potential for CCS and BEX, bioenergy CCS and fossil CCS in Sweden. And then I'll, I'll come to these supply chain costs that I, I had in the title. So in Sweden, we have, as probably has been clear uh, from this morning, we have uh, several large point sources of emissions. So these are the ones that exceed 500 kilotons per year. And as you can see, uh, a significant share of those are located uh, along the coastline will obviously will facilitate ship transport for for um, the co2 to storage um, and and uh, is it only me who is very bad at this or no. uh, on on uh, storage in the north sea but it could be also uh, there are some potential of storage in the in the baltic sea and and also uh, uh, nearby and around Denmark uh, and the south of Sweden. But of course, what is mostly known is, is the North Sea, which is... Uh, uh, and this is a mix of uh, biogenic and fossil fuel emissions, and, and, and Sweden is quite unique, uh, as we have the, the quite a number of large uh, uh, biogenic emissions from pulp and paper industry and from combined heat and power plants in district heating networks. So uh, we have looked at the costs and maybe the exact costs are maybe not you should look for here, but this is in the order of a, typically looking at anthrocyte of a kind plants. And these are industrial point sources of emissions, cement, iron and steel, uh, refinery, chemical industry, uh, and pulp and paper industries. And as you can see here, we have the cost uh, for capture and we have uh, the amount of CO2 for all these stacks. Some of these plants uh, have more than one stack, for instance, in the refineries. And the green bars are the bionic ones and the grayish ones are the fossil ones. And we can see that it's about 23 or 24 uh, million ton per year. That would be the potential for these 28 industrial sites. And the cost range somewhere between 40 and 110 euros per Per, per ton of CO2 captured. And then the dotted line is sort of the cost, uh, a very rough estimate for the transportation and storage cost. Uh, two things one can comment here is that uh, first, it's for these only these 28 plants, it's about more than half of the Swedish total CO2 emissions, CO2, not greenhouse gas, all emission sources, transport uh, industry uh, households. So that shows that it's, of course, CCS is, has a very powerful potential in that respect. Uh, the, the greenhouse gas emission somewhere exceeds 50 megaton per year. The other thing is, of course, uh, our addressing Norway here is that cost is not the same as price. So, of course, it depends on what you Norwegians will charge us for storing in the North Sea. So I, I know that what has been offered is higher than what we, our estimates. 
but it will have a rather small impact on what I will show in the in the next uh, uh, in the second part of my presentation. Then we have combined heat and power plants, and uh, I think the next talk will uh, will focus on that plant in Vatan Stockholm. But there are uh, a number of those, so we have almost all. Small towns up to the big cities have district heating networks in Sweden, so that's quite unique. And uh, the biggest one are obviously in the uh, in the big cities. And of course, not all cities are by the coastlines. So we also have cities uh, uh, far away from the coastline, which obviously obviously will increase the cost for for transport to a, a hub. So here are some hubs we are doing work on on the infrastructure here. And here is a similar figure that we, we did on, on the combined heat and power plants, where the, the amount and, and somewhat the cost will also depend on how much of the heat that you recover. But this is one example. And again, it's somewhere between 40 and, and uh, yeah, some of them are very small, so obviously the cost will increase very much. But this is uh, the capture and the transport to the nearest uh, hub. Uh, uh. So here again, we see that some exceeding at least 10 million ton per, per year. So if we put this together, uh, the potential, of course, this will take long time to, if ever implemented, we could say capture more than 30 million ton per year at the cost, say, of 125 euros per ton or so, if nth of a kind, the, the cost that we, we get from this type of cost analysis that one doing this type of work. Initial produce may be, of course, more costly. So again, one can compare with the total Swedish CO2 emissions about 40 megaton per year. Uh, now, the second part of... <laughs> of my... Uh... Oh, yeah. So now, obviously, the, as has been brought up here, the cost is it's a challenge. So here are two examples, the cement and the steel. Is a work we did some years ago. So the cement price, if uh, uh, applying CCS, will be almost double, or in this case, we calculate 70% higher. The steel, in this example we, we did, is 25% higher. I should mention that the pathway today in in uh, in Sweden for the steel is for, is uh, hydrogen-based steel. So so the it's not CCS, but actually the estimates for hydrogen-based steel are around this figure as well. And then I think there are three things one could think about. Uh, and that is this, as I mentioned, the supply chain, which is all operations from the basic material to the end product. Uh, so you have a lot of things going on there uh, in these industries and putting, a, for instance, a car together. And linked to that is the value chain. That's all the value that you create. So in short, you have a very large share of, for the basic material of the CO2 emissions in the beginning of the value chain, where the value is low, but where the value is high, the share of the emissions is sort of the, or the, the, the share or the cost is, is low. So this is a good thing to, to think of because eventually it's us all con consumers that have to pay for, for fixing the climate in the end. So the question is, would it be a lot of a high share of our economy or not? The other thing which I think is different today from, say, 10, 15 years ago is that we have the whole climate change issue is what is called a collective action problem, sort of linked to the prisoner's dilemma, who should be first and, take, and be a forerunner. And um, there is more and more agreement, and in particular in companies uh, far out uh, to the right in the, in the value chain or supply chain that they have put up emission targets, scope one, two, and three. So say Volvo cars, for instance, in Sweden, they have, will be zero neutral. It's the target by year 2040, including scope one, two, and three, meaning that they need fossil-free steel. They need uh, fossil-free, and then we have the hybrid product in Sweden. They need fossil-free transport, and we had a Willemsson Valenius sail ship for transporting their car. So that is, I think, a rather powerful driving force, as is, of course, uh, policy measures. And uh, yeah, there was a Nobel Prize winner who is dealing with these issues, which is quite, she wrote some works on climate, which are quite interesting, I think. Uh, uh, so here, if we look now again at the supply chain, this is for cement, say uh, from cement to a building. And then again, you remember that uh, uh, steel to a car. And then we put the same 
yeah, this is the sort of the value chain, the the part of this, and of course a lot of here in the in the end product production cost where you increase the value a lot. So here again is this the increase in price, and now we go through the value chain, and then we get this very small. Uh, of course, it depends. We have in these papers here we have some different cases, but typically less than half a percent. And then of course we haven't done anything on lighter constructions and things that would actually reduce the cost. And maybe in the future we will not have such ridiculously big cars, which will actually also reduce the cost. Um, and uh, so this is, is quite good news. So it, it will be a rather small cost for us all. Then of course it's another question, how should this be uh, uh, passed on through the value chain in a transparent way? And how should, how should we fix a system so we can pay for it? That, that's another issue, but it's good news that this is. And this is actually just another way to say what was already, yeah, has been noted on a, on a macro level, for instance, in the Stern report, that compared to the total economy, it's a rather small part of, of fixing this uh, climate. And in this access product, we are doing some additional and more up-to-date studies here. So here we have looked at the cement to uh, a high-speed railway. And uh, we have looked at the uh, fluff pulp to diapers, uh, so rather different type of products. But we get the same type of uh, result that you have in the in the first part of the, uh, the material production compared to the end product. You have, a, of course, a value creation and the share of this CCS uh, mitigation will be very small. So that that's sort of good news. So if I sum up this in Sweden, we have a large potential for CCS and bio CCS or BEX. So we can be a carbon dioxide removal forerunner if we play our cards right. And um, of course, there is a deep uh, possibility with the, for deep emission cuts at the small price increase of the final products. And of course, that is very important, I think, for gaining acceptance for policies and also to stimulate voluntary markets. Uh, and of course, these internal company targets, because that also makes that these companies that actually put up these targets, they can get a good message that that will not in the end necessarily be a big additional cost or price for the product. Uh, actually, all of their exist products, they actually, it's already profitable to that people or some customers are pay, uh, prepared to pay a premium for a climate neutral or climate positive product. Of course, the challenge is uh, financing has been brought up here. Um, so we need incentives. Of course, we have the UETS for the fossil emissions, but for the negative emissions or the biogenic emissions, we do not yet have any incentives. However, in Sweden, that is proposed and actually be launched next year, a reversed auctioning system, reversed in that there are many potential sellers and one buyer, the state, that will uh, uh, offer these um, uh, sort of uh, negative credits that you can you can you can uh, um, participate in the auction. Um, so that is sort of a government guarantee over quite many years. Um, then, of course, that needs sooner or later to be eventually we all have to pay for this. Um, and of course, I think it's important also to, to mention that uh, to get acceptance for CCS, that it's part of an overall mitigation portfolio. And of course, one should always seek for other uh, more sustainable, for after, when it comes to fossil fuel uh, mitigation, of course, CCS is a sort of techno fix thing. So, and that's the reason why, of course, this uh, fossil free steel hydrogen in Sweden is more sustainable, of course, because you you are not any more dependent on import of coal. But anyway, I think it's a positive message that it's a small share for all of us if we can get CCS rolling. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I know some publications. Yeah, I know acknowledgements. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, one uh, short question for Philip, if somebody has something. I think it uh, adds up very well with we're here with cities being ready to be public procurers also. It's not going to be that expensive for them, it seems, either. Yeah, yeah. And we have the Swedish uh, National um, Trafikverket, the, uh, the road administration. Mm. They are a big procurer of, of uh, concrete. Um, yeah. All, so. Okay. Thank you very much. We are going to have our next presenter online, I hope. It's going to be Marco Mazzotti from the ETH in Zurich.
who is going to tell us about following the CO2 chains from capture to storage. Good afternoon, Christine. Can Good you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and I can see you, Marco. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. I'm sorry not to be here, but not to be there, but uh, I had to teach and um, that's also important. So, um, thanks for letting me talk. Uh, I've slightly modified the title by talking, because um, I want to talk about change today, tomorrow, and beyond. And I will go and in beyond. the reverse order. And I will go in the reverse so order. The future, well, so, what do we need in the future? Well, what we see today is that the net zero targets, 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 targets are driving a huge momentum for the CWS. But if, the but if you look at the, uh, how the, the, the capture capacity has increased and how the planned pipeline of projects uh, is coming along, we don't really see um, uh, the speed that we need. And so we, we realize today that CCUS is a necessity, it's not an option, but we are, I'm not sure we are in the position that we can deliver in 2050 uh, CCS uh, capabilities for all the emitters we have all over Europe um, in sectors that will remain in 2050, you see them listed here, order of magnitude is hundreds of millions of tons of CO2 in 2050, but we also see only a few storage hubs uh, coming in, in development and in planning, and you see them indicated on this slide. So um, there are a number of key bottlenecks in implementing CCUS, and I'm proud that in Access, actually, we are looking at them, um, as you see in the scheme on the right. So we have a lack of CO2 transportation and storage infrastructure, um, and in the absence of such a shared network, industries and businesses may not be able to manage the risk associated with the coordination of the CCUS supply chain. We have a lack of stronger policies around the value on carbon and other financial incentives that are needed. We have a lack of a legal and regulatory framework, um, especially when we talk about cross-border transportation for geological storage and to the long-term storage liability. Things are improving, but we are not there yet, I think. And of course, the public is, I think, behind in understanding how CCUS can benefit uh, the climate and the society. And I would like now to show um, these uh, long-term scenarios from a Norwegian and the Swiss perspective. Um, this is a recent paper by uh, uh, Simon Rusanali of, of, of Sintef and colleagues, where we see the typical diagram, where we see the amount of uh, volumes of uh, CO2 transported increasing over the years, in this case, in the next uh, decade, uh, from different plants all over uh, Norway, of course, Norway can profit of uh, ship transport, um, and uh, you see how the, the, the routing and the connections develop uh, over the years. And one can see in, in the study that uh, by, by optimizing uh, the transport investments, uh, one can really improve also in terms of, uh, of final cost. I don't have time to go into the details. I want to show you the Swiss perspective, where you see a similar diagram. Uh, evolution of amounts of CO2 transported and stored that uh, should uh, kind of uh, uh, fulfill the requirements of the policy at the city level, uh, for example, the Zurich city strategy at the national level and uh, at the yeah, federal level. We are talking about uh, 10 million of tons of CO2 per year that will have to be dealt with in 2050. The, interestingly, with respect to Norway, we start at a very low level, so 1,000 tons of CO2 per year. And we realized a couple of years ago that in order to think of doing CO2 at the scale needed in 2050, we need to start, and we can only start small. And that's why now, in, in the second part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, what we can do tomorrow and what we can do already today. But let me underline one fact, that uh, when we talk about uh, taking CO2 in Switzerland and bringing it to a storage site, Northern Lights or Carbfix in Iceland, we need to go across borders. We need the different transportation modes. So admittedly, the problem for Switzerland, but also for Germany and other European country is more difficult than uh, for Norway. You will have the slides. You can read the details in this box uh, by yourself. So let me look at the tomorrow uh, solutions for a scale of CO2 uh, between 100,000 tons and 1 million tons of CO2. That's what we do in Access, in uh, what we call Subproject 3. We are looking in one of the, of the work packages there at the so-called um, pioneering um, sources of CO2 that look at for a point-to-point -point supply chain. There are four storines in Sweden, uh, two cement plants, sorry, pulp and paper plant, two cement plants of Heidelberg cement in Poland and uh, Germany, 
and the waste to energy plant in Switzerland, Kafawa Lind. And um, let me take uh, this uh, last example. Um, how do we get from, uh, from uh, the waste to energy plant in Lind all the way to a storage site in Northern Lights? Well, the way we approach the problem in, in access is that of looking at all possible connections from Lind to Northern Lights, looking at all possible routes, all possible um, transportation modes. So we look at potential, um, as I said, then we do an assessment of the technical, economic, environmental performance of these different routes, including life cycle assessment. Then we can apply a, a, a multi-objective, we can apply a network model and uh, uh, use it into, in the scope of multi-objective optimization problem to identify the optimal path. And what we are trying to do also, which is very important, we are trying to include considerations of real life constraints, um, regulatory issues, public perception, policy decision, these are also included. And uh, uh, at the end of this analysis, we come up with one route, right? From Lint in Switzerland, all the way to Northern Lights. Um, we need to, and you see the steps of the chain from the capture um, that takes place at the plant, of course, conditioning and temporary storage. Then we have a truck to reach Basel where we can um, exploit the bulk, sorry, a, a, a barge along the Rhine and then a ship to cross uh, to Northern Lights, and then we have storage. And of course, each of these steps has its uh, specific features, also in terms of uh, um, conditions of the CO2 along the way. This implies we need also temporary storage to connect one transportation mode to the next. And of course, there are challenges. For example, now thinking of traveling along the Rhine is a big question mark, because we are not sure that this is actually possible long term. When, when all this is done, we can, of course, come up with the level up, levelized cost of avoided carbon and split it into the uh, corresponding components and um, get to uh, the total cost. Um, this is the, the perspective of tomorrow. But as I said, we felt that we need to do it today to start the process. And I'm switching to another project that, that, I'm, that I'm leading. It's called DEMOP Karma, Demonstration and Upscaling of CO2 Management Solutions for Switzerland where we are now um, starting last year, we have started to take CO2 from a biogas plant in Switzerland and um, in one case transport it to a concrete facility where it is used to recycle concrete aggregates. We will do it for about 500 tons of CO2 in the course of one year. And on the other side, we take the same CO2 and we bring it to Iceland, all the way to Iceland, to store it underground using the carb fix technology. And we will do it for 1,000 tons of CO2 per year. Let me tell you a little more about this second route, uh, where CO2 is, uh, is injected in basalts, where it reacts, forming solid carbonates uh, pretty quickly. Um, so this is the plant where the CO2 is sourced, and you see some technical data here. It's a facility that uh, emits uh, five to 6,000 tons of CO2 per year, which is pure, because after biogas upgrading, the CO2 is emitted pure. And um, at the other end, uh, we are going to inject CO2 in Elguvik, uh, mixing it with the seawater. It's a new technology that Carbfix is um, going to test with us. And um, well, this is the a, a photo of the injection facility. And here you see the experience that Carbfix X has in the last eight years. They have injected almost 80,000 tons of CO2 um, over the course of um, yes, this 10, year, 10 years using CO2 from the geothermal field in Helishaidi. So um, where do we stand uh, with the supply chain? That was the plan. So to take uh, the CO2 with the biogas in Bern, putting it in, in an isotainer in this tank, transporting it by truck to Basel, then by train um, all the way to the Rotterdam Harbor, the same isotainer would be put on a ship and taken to Reykjavik and there with the truck to the injection site. Uh, the plan uh, was to do it for with one uh, isotainer of a capacity of 20 tons of CO2, one isotainer per week for a total of 50 trips. The round trip time is five weeks. We have started to do this um, end of July. So you see the isotainer in Bern, then the, the isotainer put on the train in Basel, and then on the ship in Rotterdam, and finally it has arrived at the Reykjavik Harbor and it's been taken at the injection site. In injection is imminent. When I'm saying imminent, it could start tomorrow, Monday, or maybe in one week, but we are re really 
ready to take the CO2 from the, this three CO2 from this container into the ground. Now, this is, uh, well, this does nothing to the climate, right? But it allows us to start these developments that are so important for us in Switzerland, but for everybody, I think, being Switzerland, a typical, uh, let's say, landlocked country in Europe. So what are the lessons that we have learned so far? That's uh, very important, and they are important lessons. So the CO2, this is my last slide. The CO2 transport solution is feasible from a technical point of view, but there are still regulatory obstacles and uh, they need to be solved uh, in view of the project continuation and the scale up initiatives from both Swiss and Icelandic sites. In Iceland, they want to develop a large storage hub called uh, Coda Terminal. They have received also the innovation fund uh, to do that. So these issues have to be resolved. Uh, at the moment, there is a major issue at, at national authorities level within countries and between countries about the classification of CO2, whether it is a chemical product that is transported or whether it is waste. And this has implications on permitting on the one hand, but also on public acceptance, as you can imagine. Um, and these regulatory concerns, and I underline the fact that, that we are not taking CO2 from the Oslo waste energy plant to the Oslo injections, to the sorry, Norwegian injection site, right? We're really taking CO2 from Switzerland through Germany, Netherlands, and all the way to Iceland. So these re regulatory concerns require, require coordination at international level. And this has to be done early because they could have an impact on other implementation aspects, including public acceptance. Of course, the whole project has been developed during COVID, has started uh, during the difficulties we have had uh, in, also in the last months. So we've been affected by uh, the, the, the difficulty with material procurement uh, of the last months. Uh, but but uh, the pi pilot project really enables at the small scale to identify deficiencies and to provide critical insights to build these, uh, we call them CCTS, so carbon capture, transportation and storage uh, supply chains. And finally, we, we are working funded by on a pilot um, demonst and demonstration fund. It's a huge pilot because it's a 3,000 kilometer long pilot. And to make it possible, as it is happening, uh, the alliance and collaboration between administration, industrial partners, and research institutions, we have 25 partners, have been key in enabling um, the, the whole thing. And uh, therefore, I'm thinking actually two sources of funding, not only access, extremely important, but also uh, the, the Swiss government for the Demo Karma project. Thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions from the audience for Marco? We have a little bit of time, if you like. Thank you, very interesting. I think we have one here from uh, Ingeborg. Thank you, Marco. Uh, this is uh, Ingeborg from Sintef speaking. Um, you, we, this has been uh, up several times during the seminar, but uh, again, for the international regulate, uh, regul uh, regulatory framework, how do you foresee or what would you want to, what kind of initiatives would you want to see to speed up the process? <laughs> a lot, so many, <laughs> because you need, you know, you need to, to first at the national level, you need to understand what the problem is and the different parts of the government and the agencies that deal with these things have to be coordinated. And we, we see now that we are trying to transport CO2 out of Switzerland, we see that this is not so easy, right? Then, of course, you need to have bilateral agreements with the countries that are going to receive the CO2 and maybe also with those that are going to be um, crossed during the transport, right? And uh, uh, I mentioned this issue whether to treat CO2 as a chemical. I mean, we use CO2 in beverages in the food industry, right? It's, it's transported everywhere. Um, but, but when you transport it to store it underground, somebody thinks that this should be a waste, actually, right? Um, my argument, and here I think we, we really need to, to start a conversation, is that CO2 for storage, for climate change mitigation, cannot be considered a chemical, but it cannot be considered a waste. It has to be considered somewhat in between, you know, uh, because, uh, because uh, this is the, the only way to make the, the, the first uh, the tests, uh, the demonstration, the pilots uh, that we need, 
and also the whole development afterwards. So I think we need the, actually the national level and the international level for coordination. Thank you. Thank you. I think okay. we had a lot about this morning that we need CCS and we need to explain what it is. And now you get to see a little bit of the technology that we have, even if we have it, we can still improve it. And uh, we need to work along the full chain. Thank you very much, Marco. Yeah. Thank you, Christine. <clears throat> Thanks. I'm here for more questions if needed. Yes. Thank you, Marco. Okay, well, it's time for our last speaker. Last but not least, we're going to hear about developing a full-scale CO2 capture um, project, and not here in Norway, but in Sweden. So I give the word to Fabian Levy from Stockholm Exergé. Yes, thank you uh, very much uh, for that. Uh, I thought I will, would uh, start this. I, I should also say I'm... Uh, I, I'm sitting on two chairs, so I'm part-time leading our R&D, but also part-time uh, researcher at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, so about one day I'm in academia. Uh, so uh, apologies for that. Uh, but uh, uh, today I'm, I'm going to start with some uh, pictures, uh, because uh, this has been a really good year for for. Uh, exposure of our CCS project. Uh, we had uh, von der Leyen uh, and our Prime Minister is uh, seen somewhat in the background uh, together with our CEO and that's me in, in clothes that I sometimes wear. Uh, and uh, another one uh, that I wouldn't have expected providing an interest in CCS is Ellie Golding, the singer who's uh, also an UNEP ambassador. Uh, and then uh, uh, we also got the Innovation Fund for uh, 180 uh, million euro to support our project. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to try to explain a little bit why, why I think we see an interest in, in our project and uh, particularly in BioCCS as well. And then also I showed this to brag a little bit, but according to Swedish culture, I'm not allowed to do that. So. Um, Stockholm Exergi, uh, which is uh, where I am about four days a week, is uh, uh, quite similar to, to uh, Celsius. We're, we're co-owned by the city and uh, then we have some uh, institutional investors, 50% uh, ownership, and uh, so very, very similar uh, uh, in that sense. And uh, this is basically what we do. So, so we do very similar thing, things. We do a lot of district heating. Uh, we do electric power, uh, district cooling, we incinerate waste, we provide uh, uh, also uh, uh, capacity guarantees for Stockholm. Uh, so if there's a, uh, limits in how much you can transfer in terms of electric power into Stockholm, we can start different units to, to provide capacity as well to the power grid. Uh, but we aim to be the largest or at least the first supplier of CO2 removals in Europe. And the reason is this, basically. Uh, this is from the last big report uh, by IPCC. It shows all the trajectories for, for, for where the climate could go. This is the result of uh, an analysis of over a thousand scenarios. And the ones that reach one, uh, two degrees, actually not even one and a half, two degrees are the ones in blue. That's 294 out of the thousand scenarios. And the common thing of all of these 294 scenarios that actually reach the Paris Agreement is that there will be some emissions left. We can't get to two degrees without getting to net zero, but there will be some emissions left because even if you put CCS on a steel mill, maybe they use hybrid, but, but even then they will have some CO2 emissions left, there are still too much to reach net zero. Uh, we will have leakage of other greenhouse gases from other sectors and so on. So there will be, uh, and, and probably we will also use some fossil fuels for uh, manufacturing uh, some, uh, for example, pharmaceuticals. And what we want to do with our projects is to provide the solution for everyone that has an obligation or by themselves want to reach net zero and they can remove maybe 90 95%, but what do they do with the last 5%? So we're aiming to provide negative emissions as a service. Th that's the whole idea behind our project. 
we want to provide a service and the ability to reach net zero for those that have some residual emissions. That's the business case we're looking at at uh, Stockholm XG. Uh, I think the, the ones that easiest way of creating negative emissions, so sucking, uh, we have a word for that in Swedish. It's uh, uh, it's uh, coal dioxide sug, uh, which is quite logical because uh, uh, a vacuum cleaner is called a uh, uh, dammsugare. So it's a similar word playing with vac vacuum cleaner. In English, it's a carbon sucker, which is a little bit less logical. Uh, but to create these carbon suckers, uh, the easiest way, of course, to think about is that you put the machine that pulls CO2 out of there. The big downside is that if you're not on Iceland and have free access to energy, then uh, sucking CO2 from a source that has about 0.041% is rather hard and requires a lot of energy. Uh, what we do is that we, we take help of this, uh, similar as Connor was talking about. So biomass, as it grows, uh, concentrate to photosynthesis, the same carbon for us. Normally it would be released back to the atmosphere if we store it instead and use it to create energy instead of using energy uh, to catch carbon. Uh, then we can create negative emissions. So of course the downside is that this is a little bit slower. So if you do direct or capture, it takes place here and now. Uh, photosynthesis is a little bit slower. Uh, also with this, I, I think I should clear a myth. So uh, we don't cut down trees to make energy in Sweden. Uh, it's uh, uh, what we use in our big combined heat and power plants are the residues after Conne has been in the forest to take out timber to make pulp and paper and uh, to build houses and uh, everything you want to do. There are some branches at tops and store dust and bark and these kind of residues. Uh, so that's our sourcing and the reason is plainly that the things we use is uh, too expensive for us, uh, or, or one of the main reasons, of course. Uh, it's the, we're 100% focused on all of the residues in this, uh, in this relationship. So, and about today we talked, it's about us, uh, one sixth of all of these residues are today uh, extracted from the forest, the other five six. Uh, uh, so what is that like, uh, uh, 90? 84% uh, something, 83% is left in the forest to rot today. Uh, so we are, today you only extract uh, a small share of all the branches and tops that are generated by taking biomass for other sources as well in Sweden. Uh, we have a thing in common uh, beside our ownership structure with uh, Celsius and that is uh, that we operate combined heat and power. And combined heat and power, when we want to create these negative emissions to sell to all of these potential customers that want to reach net zero, uh, it has some benefits. And uh, one is that you can get carbon capture with extremely high efficiency. Uh, so today we put in, uh, uh, let's see, I have my laser pointer. Uh, so we put in about 2.3 gigawatt hours of these forest residues. Uh, and then we generate about 2.2, and this is including the carbon capture, how it will look, 2.2 gigawatt hours of district heating, and we get some 250 uh, gigawatt hours of electric power output. Uh, but we're also possible to bypass the carbon capture and have a full 135 megawatt uh, uh, normal operation mode uh, if we like. And of course, from a European perspective, this is really interesting because all of these 2.2 gigawatt hours that we would produce could potentially substitute Russian gas if you did this in other places in Europe. Because Russian gas, one of the biggest things that you use uh, gas for is heating and creating hot water. So it's very interesting from that sense. And if we do carbon capture, we would use electricity uh, or steam, it, uh, more or less the same thing. We, we use high value steam or electricity to drive turbines, other things that you require in such a process. But all of it and more can be recycled back into the district heating system. And we're not cheating physics either. Uh, so we have flue gas condensation. Uh, so we also take the heat by condensating uh, all the water vapor in the flue gases. 
And in our view, the CO2 in the flue gases are 44 degrees hot. And then you're going to store it uh, uh, in a liquid form. Then you cool it and you compress it. And, and that's basically a heat pump. Uh, so if we put the process we have, the latest design, the total efficiency would go up by 3% on the combined heat of power plant by capturing, car, uh, by, by capturing CO2, which is quite cool. So we lose electric power, but the total efficiency of us us usable products that we can sell in the, on the heating market especially will go up. And that makes it also quite interesting, uh, I think, for, uh, for, from, uh, uh, to look at this in many, many more places. And this, personally, I believe it's very, very interesting to look at carbon capture, specifically at uh, combined heat and power plants for this reason, or at least where you have district heating. Then you have other benefits as well. So, but, uh, but there are some benefits with this. Uh, our particular unit that we're going to put CCS on, our target is to do it by 2026. Uh, it was commissioned in 2016. It has an extremely high concentration of CO2 of 18% in an in incineration process, which we also know how we can increase uh, all the way up to 19%. That also enables with having a high energy efficiency in, in all of this, because if you have a higher concentration of CO2, uh, then it makes it a lot easier. And there's also another upside. When von der Leyen was visiting, the actual what she thought was inter most interesting is was the flue gas condensation because that means that we are a net uh, 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 a net uh, provider of fresh water. Uh, so all the fresh water required, uh, uh, we generate more fresh water than we use in the process, which we then use uh, to uh, uh, to fill up the district heating system. So we actually use the condensate water to fill up the district heating system which is quite unique as well. Uh, so we had a public hearing about our project. We're one, one year behind Celsius. Uh, we had a public hearing uh, last week. Uh, and uh, the main things that people are stressed about is something I don't know the English word of, polling. Uh, when you need to put these big poles in the ground and you bang a lot, uh, because we're situated in the middle of the Stockholm. So. Uh, that seems to be the main. So disturbances to the surrounding and the disturbances also, of course, during operation, that it will be noise or other things because we're in the middle of uh, uh, central Stockholm. Uh, the upside with our project is that uh, uh, we do have uh, our own deep sea harbor, uh, which makes it uh, a little bit easier. So we're, we're uh, in terms of already today, we're handling ships up to 40,000 tons. Uh, at our harbor. Uh, so uh, in terms of storage and finding somewhere to send the CO2, we have some flexibility. Uh, but right now we are out at, uh, uh, we're out selling the negative emissions. So our hope is to have uh, financial closure next year. Uh, from my perspective, hopefully we have sell, sold all our 800,000 tons to corporations that want to uh, have their, uh, uh, yeah, to counter the residual emissions that they, they, they will have. Uh, but uh, as Philip was saying, they're also planning for a, a reversed auctioning in, uh, in uh, Sweden as well. So the gov uh, not the government, but the parliament has put uh, about 3.6 billion euro into, uh, uh, into this governmental auctioning to support uh, the growth of CCS project. Uh, and uh, I think one of the, the things I, I, I really, really think long term is this is really a potential for everyone working in the bio sectors. Uh, and Sweden in particular. So we know that Sweden requires three to 10 million tons uh, to reach our own climate change uh, target of getting to net zero by uh, 2045. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, Philip was saying we have a potential maybe of uh, for, uh, a billionic potential somewhere around 30 million tons in Sweden. And that, of course, also makes it a uh, um, possible export service for Sweden. So Sweden could export 12 to 20 million tons of negative emissions with help of the Paris Agreement or another mechanism to other countries. 
that doesn't have the same potential for doing negative emissions as us. So it's also a potential export industry, so we can catch up a little bit not having oil during the last uh, 40 years. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabian. Are there any questions? We have one there. Yes, Todd Flack from Bologna. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, previous presentation talked about the additional cost of the end user's product and service. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any numbers that could be compared with the steel and the cement examples, which were under 1% for the end product, which in this case was the car or the building? Yeah, I, I, I think that we can, if we take the steel, I think the cost would be somewhat similar because uh, if steel puts on CCS, they will probably have 90% capture rate. So what we offer is the ability to get to 100% by countering the last 10%. And the cost will probably be similar, but 10% higher, I guess. So then it's 6% instead of 0.6% instead of 0.5% as the numbers uh, Philip was showing for the end product or something like that. Okay, so it's much less than the price volatility for your heat and electricity, I guess. Uh, probably, but, 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 but I should say, from our perspective, this is an additional service. So, so today we have four business legs uh, that we do. So it's selling, district heating, district cooling, electric power, and then waste incineration. So the idea of negative emissions is opening up a fifth business area. So it, sometimes it must be, might be customers that already are district uh, heating customers or district cooling customers, but it doesn't have to be. So we're selling this on an international market and uh, it could be an organization, sometimes that already are customers to us, but we're perfectly open to having new customers because uh, the requirement for negative emissions to meet net zero targets does not always align with being in Stockholm. So the, the prices of uh, district heating and electricity will be marginally higher when you account for the additional in income stream. And uh, waste incineration as well. No, I, I think removing CO2 from the district heating, so that's, uh, in, in the end, that's waste incineration. And my view on that is that, uh, uh, and which also is uh, what a lot of the actors in, in Sweden is working with, is that uh, uh, it should basically implement a system that more or less says that you're not allowed to incinerate fossil waste if you don't have carbon capture. Mm. Then the cost will go out on the ones leaving the waste. Uh, and it's about 100 euro per ton of fossil waste when we did uh, some calculations on it that the cost need to be uh, for, for leaving it to incineration, uh, which account to about 100, uh, uh, so 10 euro per person uh, and uh, what is it, month. And if you do that, you have an incentive to reduce the amount of fossil waste, uh, fossil consumption overall, because it becomes more... Uh, expensive to send uh, fossil waste to incineration, but it's also an incentive for increased recycling and increased reuse. So that's what we are driving, that, that the cost for uh, the fossil parts of waste should be put in the waste management, uh, on the waste management side. That's what we're driving for. Uh, so that's our opinion. I don't know if it's uh, oh, the same perfect. discussions yeah. are in Norway. So. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I am. Thank you, uh, Ryan Hubala from uh, Aqua Carbon Capture. Thanks for uh, the nice slides. You managed to explain something that is rather complicated in a simple way, so that's always n not an easy feat. Um, you, you talked about increased uh, heat delivery when you're uh, mm -hmm. uh, operating your carbon capture uh, to the district heating, and so I guess that's nice during winter, but what happened during summer? Yeah, we, so don't, operate, we don't operate our combined heat and power plant during summer, then it's shut down for maintenance. So uh, during the normal, uh, which isn't that strange. So we always play, in, uh, so we have 60 uh, production units in the Stockholm district heating system. And we plan the maintenance, of course, uh, to the time when the heat is uh, not required as much as uh, during winter time uh, of all of these 60 units. So, uh, and we have some flexibility of 
managing how long we put a, a unit on uh, in maintenance or not, so um, prolonging or uh, shortening the maintenance period by changing the maintenance and of other units. So. A question from back there, or <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey. Hello, Marco. And uh, there's a question from online. Um, so. Um, if you scale up your transport scheme from uh, from Switzerland and to uh, Iceland uh, to large scale CO two capture, what would the CO two footprint of the transport be? So this is a question for me, if I understand correctly. Yes. <laughs> so um, we are one of the objectives of the Demop Karma is indeed to um, measure this. We are measuring the, the efficiency. We say we talk about efficiency in delivering negative emissions, right? And uh, we don't have the final numbers, but we are well above, uh, uh, I would say, 80%. So basically, if you want the carbon footprint, it would be 20%. But uh, interestingly, um, most of it uh, comes from transport by ship, uh, let's say, fired by, by, by bunker oil, right? And trains in Germany, which are still, uh, that have a, still a, a, a carbon uh, intensive um, uh, energy mix, right? So if you project uh, this operation to 2050, when we decarbonize uh, transport by rail and, uh, and uh, we use uh, ships that are net zero, then uh, the efficiency of the whole thing goes up uh, quite significantly. Okay, thank you. I would have a question actually for, may I ask a question? Yes. Please, <laughs> go ahead. So to my, to my Swedish colleagues who are doing such a fantastic job. Um, so how do uh, Swedish emitters, um, what do they do to secure storage volume uh, for the 30 million tons of CO2 that you can make available in 2045? Because you rely on the North Sea storage hubs, right? How do you secure your volume, your, your volume, uh, storage volume? Yeah, I, I, I think I can answer that. So we negotiate this answer uh, with the big oil. And uh, but but I think what is good, uh, which I think also uh, Northern Lights would agree on, is that uh, uh, there are more products coming along which pu puts some competition into that market, which I think is very healthy long term. Uh, but we're negotiating with Northern Lights. We are negotiating with some other actors, uh, and uh, uh, that is like everything else. We we close all. Uh, all business deals at, at the same time for a final investment decision, uh, but not before. And when you think it long term, I'm not sure if you hear me now, Fabio, but... When you, yes. think, when, when you think long term, mm -hmm. as we are, the main emitting sources is in the Baltic Sea. We have also Finland, Baltics and Poland, Germany partly. We see that there is geological resources in the Baltic Sea that could be suitable. But that is okay. after 2050, we believe. Yeah, Maybe 2045, but yeah. uh, but not uh, earlier than that. There are lots of Swedish legal hindrances in that case. Yes. And also other international hindrances. Mm -hmm. Also, a part of this subsea shore is, is owned by Russia. So. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, hey. do we have uh, more questions? Actually, I have one question for you, Fabian. We talked about you had a public hearing. You said what people were worried about. Do you have any positive feedback on that you're going to do CO2 capture? Yeah, a lot of, a, lo a lot of it. And uh, this was the last uh, public hearing. The first public hearing we had, uh, we have leading a commune, which is sort of the posh municipality in Stockholm, or, or one of the three poshest uh, in, in Stockholm. And uh, the answer we actually got was that they wanted our project to, uh, uh, to continue as fast as possible. And normally we get that uh, you shouldn't do that, you should do it somewhere else in Stockholm. So 
Uh, and we also did uh, a survey among uh, uh, citizens in Stockholm of how their view on bio CCS, so not necessarily fossil CCS, but on uh, bio CCS. And about 90, somewhere in between 80 and 90 percent are positive, which is also quite unique. And I think you have similar things might, maybe here in, uh, in Norway. But the view on CCS and bio CCS in particular is quite different from how it looks at some places in continental Europe. Okay. Oh. If we have time for one more question online, um, this is for Fabian as well. Uh, how do you plan to overcome compressing the huge amount of flue gas, which is necessary for the hot potassium carbonate uh, technology that you are planning to use? Yeah, we use a compressor, is the simple answer. So, uh, for us, so we have a lot of ro rotating machinery. We also operate already today the largest heat pumps uh, in the world, and uh, they are like uh, already operating 18 megawatt compressors, and this one is like 25 or something. Uh, so it's similar in size to the big industrial compressors we have at our heat pumps. So for us, it's similar equipment, just uh, put in another use. So it's, uh, for us, it's, that makes it rather okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Then I think we can close this session. Thank you very much, Fabian. Yeah, could I say one more thing? Okay. We're one of the finalists in the innovation category. So go in and, vo and vote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I uh, hope you heard what Fabian said there. So thank you very much, Fabian. And um, I would like to give the word to one of those who introduced the day today, to Marie B. Swen, to give some concluding remarks before we have a tour to the waste energy plant at Klimatrud. Please, Maria. Yes, uh, yes. <laughs> um, I have had the uh, pleasure of opening and also now closing before uh, going to, uh, on a tour afterwards. Um, I would first uh, like to uh, to start by saying thank you, uh, thank you to all, uh, to the presenters, uh, to the audience, uh, and to all of you that has followed uh, online, uh, and not at least, and uh, especially to Markus, Kristin, and uh, Ingeborg for making this, ha this happen. Um, we were very kindly uh, welcomed by the EU ambassador to Norway, Mr. Granville, uh, this morning. Uh, and then we went over to part one uh, of today, uh, and that was status of CCS in the world. What role will it play? Uh, I guess you all remember that we were presented by uh, a lot of enabling policies and framework uh, by Mr. Pelo Olof uh, Granström. Uh, and that was quite, I would say, uh, it, it, it makes me at least optimistic to see the timeline that there are many things, many important things happening. Uh, Fabian from the Commission uh, talked about the sustainable carbon cycles, which I believe will um, form uh, an important framework. And that most of us would like to see that work going maybe even quicker. Uh, it's really important. Um, and uh, Mr. Eng from, uh, from the Ministry talked about the longship and the next project and also there. Uh, no doubt that uh, many of us would like to see uh, CO2 capture uh, or the storage uh, um, being uh, made ready even quicker. We need really to step up to, to, uh, to go quick enough. We had a very interesting panel, I would say, uh, chaired by Olav Eje from Bologna. And a lot of things could be said about that, but uh, I think it would take too much time. Part two, um, introduced and chaired by Hendrik from Fraunhofer, uh, going more deeply into the social sciences part of everything, and also uh, presented uh, by uh, Eina from Oslo, talking about the climate budget and public procurement. And I think most of us will never forget that he forgot his shoes yesterday. Uh, and that was really fascinating. <laughs> uh, René from Zurich uh, gave us five, I think it was five uh, examples on, of CDR. And I think that was also very inspiring, showing these uh, different, uh, very concrete examples. Uh, and Tina from Gothenburg, uh, I think uh, showing us uh, your plans uh, and uh, 
the role of also the harbor. Uh, I really like to see uh, the harbor driving this, and I know we have uh, people here from other harbors, uh, so it will. It uh, I think that will uh, create more uh, initiatives. Uh, Gaute from in Innovation Norway chaired the panel, and I think uh, um, he also experienced that he would like to have much more time with that fantastic uh, panel uh, uh, there. And then the last part, um, uh, introduced by Kristin, uh, uh, saying a few words about the, the Access Project. Uh, Sergio from Saipem, of course, telling us about the, their enzymatic solvent system. And uh, I'm really looking forward to see the results in the project. Uh, this is real innovation, I would say. Philip from Chalmers um, uh, talked about the prisoner's dilemma. Let's not forget that. It's a very important part of the CCS uh, work. And uh, I would uh, like also to, uh, to point towards Marco's uh, work and comment uh, towards Ingeborg's uh, question, the, towards the importance of coordination, both uh, uh, internally in, in each nation and also regionally. Um, and uh, the work on the chains in access project will develop more knowledge that can make it easier for uh, policymakers to do the right decisions. I think I'm really looking forward to that. And last but not least at all, uh, Fabian from Stockholm. Um, I really like the picture of von der Leyen there uh, and the seniors and the innovation funds. But not of course, I mean, you are playing an important role in showing the, uh, Europe and the world uh, that this is possible. And of course, your technology is, is uh, super interesting. So um, by that, uh, I would like to give the word to Christine, maybe to say a few words about the practicalities uh, on, uh, on the transport. Maybe Marcus, or would, maybe would, do that. Marcus would do that. So thank you from my side. Hello. So now the trip is going to Clemens through Waste to Energy Plant. Uh, we're talking about coordination. It's not always so easy. A lot of adults are going to go in the same direction. So if everyone that is joining the bus ride could just wait out just outside this room, and then we will all leave together because we need to cross the street where the bus is parked. So and then we will have one. Um, I will go in the front, and then we'll have a colleague in the back. So make sure that everyone's follow us. And the bus tries to leave at three. So. Again, final, thank you very much, everybody, for coming, for, for joining and making this day a very, very good experience, a very good day. There will be a recording of the full day for those who missed part of it or who want to experience it again. You will receive the link. Thank you very much. And thank you. One more. Thank you to the EU delegation for hosting us. Thank you so much for making this possible.